welcome you to the Committee of the Whole meeting for June the 14th. It is 104. Uh, we'd like to call the meeting to order. We respectfully acknowledge that the land in which we gather is the unceded traditional terry of the territory of the Sequim. Approval of the agenda, recommendation that the Committee of the Whole meeting agenda for June 14th, 2023 be approved as circulated. Councillor Bushell, Councillor Rich, favor. Carried. Adoption of minutes recommendation that the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting held on May the 24th, 2023 be adopted. Councillor Evans, Councillor McCabe, all in favor. Carried. Okay, we're going to go right into our delegation. And this one is virtual. And it is Councillor. Shirley, or sorry, Shelley, and I'm not quite certain how to pronounce your last name. Hi. I don't yes. want to. Are they online? Yes. We're here. Councillor Shelley. <laughs> Hi there. White. Hi. And Shelley's from the Adams Lake Indian Band. Green Antone from Splat Scene Title and Rights. And David Jacob Harder from technic is technical lead. And this is the uh, Sequipmic Landmark Project. So you guys now have the floor. You can take it away. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. White Shelley Witzki Resquess. And uh, David, I'll let you introduce yourself. And Trina, I think Trina's here. Uh, yeah, my name is David Jacob Harder. I'm one of the artists that works on the pieces, um, as well as a the technical advisor for the project um, throughout all of the different projects, even the pieces I'm not um, a part of. Thank you, Cook's Jam. Um, I do have a presentation here. If If you'd like, I could share my screen, or if someone has it, they can... They can put it up. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, District of Sycamus, and all the folks here today for having us as a delegation today. I know you're busy. Um, so we're here to present about the Shikwapam Landmarks project, project and, um, and uh, let you know some background to it. My understanding is we've never actually done a presentation to you folks before, so I'm, I'm grateful we have that opportunity. Um, this project, as you can see, this was taken at, um, uh, this one was at your beach, the Sycamus Beach Park, the one with the elders. It was one of our meetings there. I believe that's Yes, and then the Chase Wharf. So the second photo is uh, the unveiling of the Oka sculpture at the Chase Wharf, the Memorial Park in, in uh, Chase. And that was May 13th of this year, so not too long ago. So this project was started in uh, 2018. And um, yes, thanks, you can move to the next slide. So we've just got a myriad of shots of um, some of the elders that are involved, some of our elders meetings outdoors, um, the one in the middle at the bottom is the um, Sweat's Mouth sculpture that was unveiled last year, last June at the uh, Salmon Arm Wharf. And the artisans that worked on it in the far right on the bottom, uh, there's uh, Rod Toma, Ronnie Toma and Tokotmes Toma and Eric Kuchker was one of the um, artisans as well. And um, so this was born out of um, a need that the elders identified. So I took the elders on a trip back in 2016, and this was part of the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure's four laning of the, the Trans Canada Highway between Chase and Golden. And um, they wanted us to go out and red flag, earmark, identify culturally sensitive sites, et cetera. Um, ahead of time so that we could um, identify them, be aware of them, and before, during, and after, protect them. Um, there was um, some uh, protesters within the Shokwapam Nation that shut down the, the work project at Hoffman's Bluff for about two months. 
because it's a really important um, spiritual area for us. It's um, an area that we call, it, it has a rat cave and a, and a whole myth and, um, sorry, it's not a myth, um, but uh, uh, legends and stories, ceremonies, et cetera, around it. So they brought it to our, to our attention that we need to protect these places. So I brought the elders out. We, we went to all the 17 project sites. It took three days but while we were on that trip, the elders noticed that there was nothing out there on the land that denotes that you were in Shikwapan territory, traditional territory. So, of course, at the time I was I was too busy. But once I um, decided to run for council, had a little bit more time on my hands. I wouldn't say that much more time on my hands, but we we thought of this project in 2018 and received funding in uh, 2019. And basically, it's um, large sculptures in high, key, highly visited areas uh, and working with the elders who guide it. Um, they provide the place names. We wanted to go with personal stories uh, for these areas instead of the legends. The legends are um, public. You can find them at the Royal British Columbia Museum, etc. And some of those are attached to places, but we wanted to have our people's story told. And so we started meeting out on the land uh, with the elders who provide that information. One aspect here, thank you for, for switching screens, is the trailhead post carving. So we had 100 trailhead posts donated. We went and worked with School District 83. There was five classes that um, wanted to take part. And then also Chief of Tom School at Adams Lake and Shihahaya School at Splatin. So we had um, um, about uh, a little over a hundred students carve the, um, their own original designs into the trailhead posts. We had a storyteller come out, Kenton Thomas. He talked about the story of the salmon, the story of coyote, and then explained a little bit about what pictographs are. And we wanted them to create their own pictographs. And so they went away and did that. We came back with, um, you'll see in the bottom right corner, Elder Hop Yu of uh, Splatin of the Shikwapan Nation. And he and his um, mentee, Vern Klemma, uh, came into the workshops and some of them were outdoors. You can see the little tents up there and we set up however we could uh, to, to, you know, make it as comfortable as possible for the youth to um, carve their designs. So we came back about a month later and they carved their designs. And these are now being swapped out for the um, older trailhead posts at all of the, the trailheads for the Shoe Shop Trail Alliance system of trails. And I think we've got five or six left and um, more people asking for them than we have. So we're looking at possibly doing this again. Um, and then you'll see the unveiling there that we had um, so the, this was not just Indigenous students, though we had some Indigenous students and Métis students help unveil it. This was everyone in the school district. And that was a real key part for me um, and for others involved in the project about that real spirit of reconciliation, that we're working together because we're neighbours, we're guests, um, each other's guests at events. And for that true reconciliation to, to take place, that's also creation. It's creating something together and designing it. And so it, it worked beautifully for the this project so far. And we've integrated that spirit more and more into it. And I'm not sure if there's a if there's one more slide. Okay. Um, maybe um I'll I'll do a little bit about the location and then I'll hand the floor over to Jake David. I don't want to dominate here. I, I I never used to call myself a politician, but I realize now I do talk a lot. So maybe, no, no offense. Um, so phase one locations, you can see the um the little yellow icons there. Uh, the two main landmarks that we mentioned, Salmon Arm and Chase Wharf. And then the small landmarks spread out on the land. And there's um, eight total for phase one and another eight for phase two. And um, so when you're down at the wharf at both places, um, we, we, um, we lined these up line of sight to the mountaintops that you can see from those two locations. 
So you can see the top of Bastion Mountain, you can see the top of Little Mountain, uh, Fly Hills. Um, and so that's where we decided to put the other uh, smaller landmarks, smaller sculptures, sorry. And uh, so the ones that are down there are about six, seven feet high, uh, five, six feet. And then the smaller ones will be located at the top of these areas, Bastion Mountain, Fly Hills, et cetera. And they'll be about three or four feet. And then when you're up there, there's a storyboard and a, a company and storyboard and clear line of sight back down to the to the wharf. This is based on our ancient landmark system, which I've been learning over the years. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is the phase two locations. And so we have a system of um, symbols that we would leave out on the land for each other. And this was obviously pre-contact that if you were traveling through the area, there would be markings that would show you where you could get deer or meat or where you can get fish um, or where there's um, a deer blind or something and that you were guaranteed to get food. Well, mostly guaranteed. You still have to put some effort in. And this, this ancient landmark system, we wanted to build into this. So it's um, a little bit of our, our ancient um, cultural values of helping each other. We were egalitarian societies. Uh, we shared food and also our modern concept of sharing our language, our place names and our culture with, with us today, not just with guests and tourists and our neighbors, but also with youth, indigenous youth. We've we've had some indigenous youth involved um, as interns. And, um, you know, they tell us, you know, I'm so proud. I come down here and I, I show my friends, look at this is Sweat's Mouth. This is Chikoka. And they, they're learning the language. And, and it's hard when it's not your first language. So it's it's just been an amazing journey. And, um, you know, five, 10 minutes probably isn't enough. And I think I might've gone over. So <laughs> I don't want to dominate again, um, but it's just been an amazing journey for everyone involved. We have uh, over 70 collaborators um, involved in this and now, you know, adding you folks. So, you know, we're looking at up, upwards of 80 people. And so um, thank you so much. I'll hand the floor over to Dave, to David. And uh, if he'd like to talk a little bit about the technical piece and uh, the work that we've done with your your uh, engineers, whatnot, in Skamaus. Thank you, Shelley. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, again, my name is David Jacob Harder. Um, I'm uh, aside from being one of the artists, I'm the technical lead on the project. Um, to echo what Shelley was saying, it's such a invaluable experience for myself and I'm seeing it for the community as well. Um, that part and parcel of communities working together, seeing all the different bands working together on a, a greater project to be a part of those elders meetings is, I, I feel so humbled and honored to be a part of it. Um, and I'm continually in in their debt for being such gracious hosts and, and allowing me to work with them on this project and and co uh, collaborate with so many amazing artists um, and 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 really collaborate with the different districts and, and municipalities that are involved in we've seen seen and received so much overwhelming support for the projects and it's uh, it's very exciting to see things moving forward on to phase two after we uh, finished phase one this summer, the installations. Um, just a little bit about the uh, Sycamus uh, meeting and site. Um, the piece will be, um, we, we've done a few site visits with the elders as well as the artists. Um, and I've been in contact with uh, Daryl and I had actually previously done uh, a artwork, the uh, Saskia legacy piece um, in Beach Park. I, I was commissioned by Saskia to create that. So I have an understanding and a, and a knowledge of that space and working with Daryl and, and company. Um, so when we went through all the different sites, the, the most prominent site and what was kind of talked about throughout that was um, the beach, the beach park and the location where it would be sort of high traffic, um, a view out over the landscape. This, uh, the sculpture itself, if you can move on to the, uh, the next slide, um, 
that is uh, um, essentially this fireball ball that um, has all this iconography of Sekmas um, and the elders' oral stories and the and the place names. The the artist Tanya Willard, as well as Kelsey Jules uh, from Tukumloops and Tanya Willard from Nisconlis, um have made this. Uh, they, they are just beautiful works. There is one at UBCO. Um, at the Okanagan campus um, at the School of Engineering. And there is also a, these, um, these bowls, balls, these fireballs that will be um, at each one of these uh, new locations in, in phase two. Um, what we would like to do is move forward uh, the, the actual site and whether it's ta with, in talking with Daryl and your guys' uh, support staff, is the actual location of the the top of the the uh, grass knoll that's a man-made structure on top of what is now the um, kiosk or the cantina. Um, I've been in touch with Daryl and we're going to move forward to contacting the the engineers of that the building to see what options are available um, for moving forward to install that piece there. Um, the other part that uh, we are presenting today is the partnership agreement. If you can move on to the just next slide there. Um, um, this essentially is a partnership agreement that goes over the care and maintenance, long-term maintenance of, of the artwork. Um, we've done a great deal of work exp um, kind of exploring all the different avenues of whenever creating an artwork, how to you know, preserve it long-term because ultimately these will be long, last long beyond our time and will be handed over to different um, people to care for. One thing in the design that we kind of move forward on is always being aware of guidelines of public safety as well as public interaction because we know you cannot monitor these things they will be you know whether it's graffiti or something along those lines there may be some you know negative interaction with it so we kind of design these things in with that in mind to have them you know coated with an anti-graffiti be able to be uh, easily maintained have them be kind of self-maintaining in a way that they don't need a constant um, uh, sort of attention. And then just having someone, you know, it, with it being such a high uh, profile area and, and, you know, the mowing and cleaning area, it is a much better location to be able to monitor and kind of keep public safety as far as you know, graffiti and such away from that. So in this uh, partnership, essentially, it just goes over um, the long-term care and just what what it would take if, in fact, this it was damaged to a great extent. The, the, the likelihood of that is highly unlikely. I've had I've done about sixty uh, public artworks in my career, and I've only had to go back and repair a couple uh, due to public interaction. And usually, it is a a uh, very minor thing, um, but in if the, in the event, if you could move on to the next slide, it kind of covers over what it would be to fully replace. And this kind of shows you what also we're putting in with the project in its, uh, we're pulling these from our original uh, fabrication and, and budget line items mm -hmm. um, to essentially create the work. But again, like I said, these works are created with longevity in mind and created with, um, you know, professional fabrication and engineering to sort of um, create the strongest, most sound piece uh, we can. Um, it, sculpture practice has definitely changed in, in throughout the future, and um, these are far the uh, far more. Um, less susceptible to those kind of interactions. And we will also have uh, technical criteria and things that sort of are passed on to give um, our partners assurances, whether it's engineering, how the things go together, et cetera, just to give sort of a, uh, almost a manual for the artwork. Um, 
so yeah, other than other than that, we're we're very thankful for your time. We're very um, excited about moving forward on these projects in phase two, and we're excited to uh, have the elders out for um, a, a site blessing and and working with you guys. And if you have any questions or anything, um, we'll open it up to you to come forward with those. Cook stem. Thank you. Cook Sam David. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to uh, uh, does Trina is Trina going to speak at all today? Um, Trina Anton was unable to make it today. I, okay. I just saw an email, so unfortunately, it's yeah. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you, uh, uh, David. Council, do you have any questions? Gordon, Councilor Bushell, sorry. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, yes, great presentation, Shelley and David. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I love the artwork and the, the project. It's uh, it's been a long time coming with uh, you know the Shushwap Regional Shushwap Regional Trail Strategy Group. You guys started mm -hmm. a few years talking about this, and uh, it's great to see it come to light. Um, I only had a couple of questions, and I think. David answered those, uh, the, the height of how, where it was going to be located. And then uh, is it, and would it be powered? Would there be a light inside? Would it be well lit from the inside? Like it shows in the photo and, you know, uh, where it's located, I guess it's pretty easy to get power from there. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, with that, we're hoping that we're going to be able to tap into the the panel there's actually a panel that i installed for the saskia legacy piece to light up the two figures on top of the apples um that i might actually be able to borrow from that but again it will be in the uh in working with the support staff and daryl to see what we're able to do and in talks with the engineer and the building design to see where we'll be able to uh essentially uh secure to because that is essentially um mounting it on top of the roof of that concrete structure which is a very strong structure and the pieces uh we estimate only 250 to 300 pounds um, because it is 32 inches uh, in diameter the actual sphere and i believe the full standing height is 46 inches um, so yeah i hope that answers your question um, we're hoping to have lights as if it is that uh, ever glowing light throughout as if it is that fire bowl um, currently and 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 just to make it more interactive also the light aspect um, i found in my own work that uh, it it decreases the potential of vandalism and people give it a little bit more respect in that regard because there is a light and you know vandals i guess are scared of light <laughs> great thank you david and uh, thank you shelly appreciate yeah, it you're welcome uh, i just wanted to mention quickly that we do have a small fund that we've set aside the three bands have contributed to uh the potential replacement uh of any of these sculptures so we're, we're not we don't want to put a, an onerous financial burden on any of the communities to have to do that on their own uh thank you Thanks, Shelley. Councillor Bailey. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the sculpture is beautiful. It's uh, quite a nice, um, quite a nice piece. I, I have has that already been selected? Is it be the fire bowl? I'm, it is okay. Yeah. Um, and just maybe one other thing I just put in for consideration in terms of sites. I mean, we're building a healing center. We have, which will be a pretty prominent site, and it will have. Quite a bit of I think history and discussion around what that property means and the significance around it. So I would just like to throw that into the mix of consideration because I think it would be again one of these prominent sites that you're looking for and uh, potentially tell a very kind of cohesive story of how we partnered with uh, First Nations and and you know just maybe maybe there's an opportunity there. So I'd just like to. To put that but thank you very much for your presentation today and uh yeah thanks again 
Yeah, cook Shem for that. Um, we we actually did have a couple meetings with the Splatine elders, uh, one in person, and this was still when there was snow on the ground. Um, okay. So back in February, and uh, at that time, so we went out and saw um, with your, I believe, it was, um, and your one of Darryl. your engineers, yeah, Daryl, and. Yeah, and so we we saw the three sites together, David, uh, Libby, the project coordinator, myself, I believe Dory was there, um, and, and yeah, yeah. Uh, Tanya was there, the other artisan, so she's a Shukwapam artisan, and we looked at the three sites between all of us. We, you know, we kind of had our own preferences. Uh, we were looking at the site where the healing center is going to go, and so we took all this information back to the Splatine elders, um, and they wanted to see the site themselves in person. So we worked with their elders coordinator and uh, they brought them out on um, uh, in their own vehicles, I believe. I think they were trying to get a bus, but they couldn't. Uh, and so we went out there. This was recently um, about a month, a month ago, I believe, a month and a half yeah. ago. And um, the elders themselves walked to the three sites. We looked at all of them and their preference actually was uh, above that building at the Sycamus Beach Park. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we just uh, make room for the, the elders to guide these projects, to guide this project and to guide the, the progress of it um, and respect that, um, <clears throat> you know, they've been around 80, 90 years. They're fluent language speakers. They have a connection to the land that, you know, my generation still is still learning and whatnot. And certainly younger generations, the kids in their 30s, 20s, you know, and younger. Um, but their connection is is much deeper. And, and they felt that they wanted it there. Um, and so we, we just respect that. Uh, it was a, an old village site in the area. We know that. Um, there's archaeological sites we know there. There's, a, a, a I believe, a grave somewhere nearby. And and they felt that that was just the best spot that they, they they wanted it. So, but thank you for for that. Yeah, we're look we're excited about the healing center too. But maybe that's another opportunity for another Shukwapam artisan, or maybe um, uh, an, a reconciliation uh, Shukwapam and, and non Shukwapam artisan to work together to to do something at that site. Oh, awesome! Thank you, Shelley. Yeah, uh, Daryl. Uh, through the chair, I was just going to echo what she said. We did a bit of a tour. The elders really preferred. I thought the healing center was a really good idea as well, but uh, they seemed to like the beach park. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this. Um, what's the timeline? Um, yeah, so right now we're in preliminary engineering, um, just essentially ensuring these sites are hospitable for the, the installation, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, some of the design elements, uh, the Shaquetan uh, wording, um, and then also some of the design approval process that we go through with the, uh, the elders. So we go through these processes and, and ultimately that dictates the timeline. Currently we are installing the phase one this summer and we're looking to install phase two in uh, the summer 2024. So fabrication over the winter this year. Thanks, David. Councilor Beach. Thank you, through the chair. This is, it's absolutely beautiful. I'm gonna get you to speak up, please. Okay, sorry. Um, that close. The piece, the sculpture is absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm just, the fact that there's light inside it, I'm just, curious I couldn't see anywhere where I was reading what the actual fabric of the sculpture is going to be obviously steel. pardon me steel it's oh. quarter inch steel uh base plate of a half inch and then the piece uh itself the actual bowl is depending on the final engineering specs but the original was uh I believe quarter inch um uh pickled in oil mild steel and then okay. forged and, and cnc welded and such Beautiful. thank you excellent thank you anyone else councillor mccabe yes uh thank you it does look like a a nice piece of artwork um 
in in our part of the agreement, we're accepting the liability and and then the cost that to have it insured. And so there's just a minor cost there, but insignificant compared to the significance of the piece of artwork we're getting. Um, lighting would that be probably LED lighting again to keep the sound for the electrical portion of that? Yeah, so essentially there will be uh, architectural lighting, um, which is uh, waterproof housing, LED, very low, um, very similar to the piece that's uh, the the Saskia piece, um, probably smaller light since it's a, a little bit smaller of an area that it needs to light. Um, yeah, so it'll be all the LED and all architectural. So with, you know, standard um, uh, electrical code wiring and, and conduit, et cetera. Thank you, David. Anyone else? Yeah, I think it's a beautiful piece of art too. And I look forward to uh, this discussion continuing and, and see how the, uh, the project rolls out. Thank you, David. Thank you, Shelley, for being here today. We really appreciate it. Cooks Jam for your time on your busy schedules. You're very welcome. Thank you. Cooks, Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Take David. Care. See you. Bye. Okay, moving forward, we have customer service training recap. The DOS did a uh, staff customer training, so we're just going to go through a recap with that. And Tracy Lawrenson, who is Civil uh, Excellence, is here to share with us. Tracy, take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Perfect. Okay. I just wanted to, I actually offered this opportunity through Kelly and the team to speak to you about the two half days that I spent with your entire work crew. Um, my background is I'm a lawyer by training, do governance work, and for 20 some years I've worked with local governments. I'm also in Vernon, so I'm nice and close by. But I got to spend time with each of your um, staff people and bundled into their groups. And I guess I just wanted to take this opportunity to let you as a council know that it's as elected officials, you get hit with a lot of service concerns and why isn't this and why isn't that? That always happens. But I wanted to take the opportunity to tell you how lucky you are. Um, I work with a lot of management teams. I work with a lot of frontline teams. And having spent a half day with all of your employees, um, when I look at your strategic plan and the values that you as a council have chosen around collaboration, around service excellence, um, just wanted to take an opportunity to tell you, having been under the hood with your staff, how unequivocally they are walking the walk. We spent time talking about the systems in which good customer service gets delivered, because there's a lot of rules in local government, and a lot of times service looks differently. Um, you know, it's not, would you like fries with that today? At times, there's things being done to people on behalf of other people, and was really impressed with people understanding the context in which their work happens. Um, we spent time talking about what are people frustrated with in each of the portfolios in each of the areas and your staff brainstormed ways to reduce that friction, ways to um, enhance customer service. And I know that as elected officials, you know, even without it being one of your core values in your strategic plan, how important it is that you can sleep at night knowing that these talented professionals are worrying about this. And your brand new employees um, are very much being infused with this culture of strong service. Um, the other thing that was interesting is just that they're modeling the innovation that's happening at the highest level in Sycamus. You know, the medical center, healing center, there's a, you know, you're punching above your weight class as a small community in terms of not looking for excuses why things can't happen, but finding ways to get stuff done. And I was really impressed with the, that same sort of focus from your staff on looking for ways to get more done within the umbrella. Also looking and challenging, why do we do things a certain way? Not just assuming that the same old way. Um, the, the, I guess the purpose in talking to you as well is that most of the time when people are frustrated with service, it's actually that they don't like the rules, which really are councils, um, you know, for there really needs to be a way through your CAO back to council to say, we're getting a lot of pushback on this rule. Is this still as important to you as elected officials or not? The next kind of complaint you get is we agree with the rule, but we think it was applied inappropriately. 
And that's really for your CIO and her management team to give some direction around the interpretation of rules. And then the final area where complaints come up is we think your rules are awesome, they totally were applied properly, and your person was rude. And unfortunately, if we don't ask those first two questions, everything looks like a three. And so just this reminder that you as elected officials play such a profound role in service excellence. Sometimes you know, the people at the front line in a private sector role have better data than their bosses. They're, they're out sort of interacting. In, in a weird way, we've got an hourglass in local governments where you as elected officials are also out in the community. And the big, I guess, message back to you is, and, and I hope I'm not overstepping, but just wanted to take a bit of a moment to talk about just one or two tips that I would have for how you support service excellence and your team. First of all, by not over responding when people are frustrated with something because most of what we do that's meaningful in local governments doesn't make everybody happy. You know, doing things well, quite often when we, when bylaw writes a ticket, we don't in any way want that person to be rude or dismissive, but the odds of that person being super happy about their ticket, very low. And so we talked to you, know, even in the training just about, um, and the, your staff have a high degree of confidence in you as a council, but I will say, and without, you know, I, I don't, I hope I'm not overstepping, but somebody on the management team can, can cut my mic if I am. Um, the, the one request was that when you get complaints that you say, oh, that doesn't sound like our team. Let me check into that versus the sort of, and, and they're not suggesting you're doing this, but this is something that elected officials in a desire to be compassionate with the public can say, oh my goodness, leave that with me. You know, that, that notion of um, understanding that it may be more nuanced in terms of the experience of the individual, not to say they're not accurate, but there may be more context there. The other um, areas I understand and, you know, speak up if I'm wrong, but you're a group of really nice people. You're well connected in the community. You've got sort of deep roots and points of contact in the community. And I know a couple of you are at LGLA, and I also shared this in one of the talks I did at LGLA, just a reminder of how important it is that you not get directly involved in delivering service concerns into the district hall. And I know that feels like the right thing to do, you know, where, you know, if somebody comes up to you and they say, I've got this problem, well, leave it with me, I'll look into it. Nobody likes to say, we'll call city hall. That That's an awkward sort of thing. But one of the things that's really important and, and um, I just like to take the opportunity if I have a chance to remind elected officials that your power is in fixing systems so that the people who don't know you as elected officials get the same level of service as somebody who does know you. Because there's sort of that notion that if somebody knows an elected official and can get them on the line and get them, then almost we're creating this VIP express line for those people that know elected officials. And most of the people I work with don't want a two tiered service system. They want the service system to work for everyone. So just that reminder as elected officials, and, and, and in part, this is also a request from your staff is just, if you could feed those concerns into your system. And one of the things that I've suggested to your CIO and, and leadership group is, um, if people don't hear back within 24 or 72 hours, that absolutely is something that elected officials should get involved with and not necessarily hearing back with the answer they want, but the, the entitlement to, to, for, to know that something's happening with it. But that council really focus on service systems versus one-off service interactions. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, I just really, I, again, part of this was just to tell you, and, and I think you may know this, I hope you do, but whether it was your inside staff, your outside staff, the ways they sat at tables and talked to each other in mixed teams. Um, I do a lot of this customer service work in regional districts, small and large municipalities, and you're really, really lucky um, with the folks you have. And, and bluntly, your staff are one of your key customers as elected officials, they've hitched their wagons to this train. And so just that notion about how do you serve them as well as how do they serve the community? Um, but I guess I just wanna take this opportunity to tell you what you probably already know as a council that um, they really respect you as a council. They feel lucky to have you there and also feel we went through why people love working in Sycamus and um, 
it was pretty special. Anyways, that's really all I wanted to say, but I'd love to answer any questions that folks might have about the work we did around customer service. Tracy, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And I think all of us at uh, Marin Council feel that we have one of the best teams um, around. Like we are, we are so pleased with them and love working with them. So all of them, but uh, you make me want to go and buy them all a present, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of feeling that little flutter in my heart. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> and, and that's your so shirt in there. <laughs> But anyway, thank you so much, Tracy Council. Do you have some comments and feedback? Tracy, one of the uh, I'll I'll just uh, one of the things that I want you I want to thank you for um, shining a, a spotlight on is sometimes we do and we're all guilty of it. We do create a VIP line, and we people come to us in the community and we. Try to get we we try to resolve it and totally understand that sometimes and it's hard not to as elected officials because yes. it's very hard. Um, yes, you want to fix everything quickly, right? Yeah. So um, I do appreciate you sharing that with us for sure. Okay, uh, Councillor McCabe. Yeah, no, just just the same sentiments that our mayor just spoke. Um, yeah, it's it's. Great advice, and thanks for the reminder. Anyone else? No, just, just say, Councillor Bailey. I, I just want to maybe touch on this VIP line aspect, and you know, I democracy is a little messy. I think we can <laughs> all agree there that this is. Um, there's two components to what we do here. One, there's a representative body that gets elected, and we have certain certain responsibilities to the folks that elect us as well. And um, I, I don't know if it's so much about creating a VIP line. It can be like that, but it could also be incredibly helpful. And I think we need to see the other side of that when we're helping people interact with City Hall and the apparatus that we have here. And um, so I, I don't want to cast it in a... In a um, in, in a light that people can't go and interact with elected councillors like ourselves and us being a productive and useful conduit to helping hmm. people through a system that sometimes confuses them. And, and that at the ultimate uh, end of the day is democracy in action can be a little messy. And, and I you know take your, your points in that, um, that it, it's important to give people the benefit of the doubt and to work through on either side, some of the issues that that I think we deal with as counselors as well. So I really appreciate your presentation and, and thanks very much for it. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Bloody. Tracy, did you want to speak to that? No, I just wanted to reinforce, I truly understand that intention and that interest. And, and just to build on that is um, making sure that the systems are streamlined for everyone. And I, and, and I think the point is, is that it's not black and white. I, I truly do do agree on that, but um, just it, by all accounts, this is a very high functioning council. And so taking the opportunity to make sure that all systems, whether it's your online systems, your phone systems, the service resourcing you've got are, are set up so that that navigation is more likely to be fixed. Um, but so, so I think you're right. It's, it's more nuanced than I've made it. Absolutely. Thank you, Tracy. And yes, thanks, uh, Councillor Bailey. Councillor Evans? Tracy, thank you for the coaching. Um, is there um, your civic ex excellence organization, um, is there uh, seminars that we could go to or anything like that so we could tune ourselves up? Well, I do some governance work for sure on this customer service Um there is there, there's certainly some resources that I have on that. By all accounts, you're doing really well as a group. So just to be clear, as much as I, you know, any consultant would love to bake themselves in, as it relates to good governance, um, this is one subset of it, but just this continued focus on how you get better. The governance, you know, are you doing quarterly check-ins as a council on how you're doing? Because quite often we think that leadership starts with your CAO. And so the only thing that I would suggest that, that I think is, 
really important for a high performing group is man to stick the landing while you're still high performing because it's harder if you get broken. So from a civic excellence perspective, if I were to suggest, you know, how this council continues to support excellent service, it would be by answering a little bit differently just by being excellent at the governance table, because it impacts your economic growth, your housing, all of the elements um, at of your strategic plan are impacted by the way this group interacts with each other and with the team through Kelly. And again, that this is not a group that needs remedial work from what I understand, but it is a group that might benefit from building on the things that are going well to prevent the things that can get in your way. But thank you for asking. Thank you, Tracy. I wanna take this opportunity to thank staff. You guys do a good job too. And thank you for your support. Um, making our positions easier as well. And so thank you very much. Uh, does anyone else have any comments? Tracy, thank you so much. My Appreciate absolute pleasure. Here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me spend that half day with each of your staff people. It, it was a really enjoyable time for me to learn on the good thing about the good things the district is doing. So thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Tracy. Bye-bye. Half a day. You guys are going to have to book some vacation time now because. <laughs> um, okay, moving along. Mosquito control update. Cheryl from EWP Consulting. Our favorite topic mosquitoes. <laughs> Yay, it's mosquito time. Take it away, Cheryl. Yes. Oh. So I'm a mosquito control contractor for the District of Sigma. This is my team. I'm going to go away to the 14th or the 15th summer. First summer, Brian took me around. I was super pregnant with him. He me around in the UTV to see if Um, so I'll just go over some basic mosquito biology because I think a lot of the myths and concerns and beliefs about mosquito control stem from just a lack of knowledge about mosquitoes. Um, what we do for mosquito control, habitat ID, monitoring applications, um, how the season's going so far, and then we can open up to questions. So basic mosquito biology. Mosquitoes are like caterpillars. We always learn about caterpillars at school. But what we don't learn is all the flies and all the beetles have that same four stage life. So mosquitoes emerge from the water as adults. So anytime I use the word adult mosquito, it means that stage, the stage that we all see flying around right now. So there's no baby adults. You'll say, no, it's just the baby ones out right now. <laughs> Those are all adults, but different species are different sizes. Adults mate and lay eggs. Eggs, depending on the species, can be laid on the surface of water, like these ones, or the majority of the ones here are laid in moist soil. They can live in that soil for up to 30 years, waiting for another flood, waiting to get wet. Once it emerges, it larvae then. So the eggs hatch, mosquito larvae come out. These are some of the different types of different species, different groups of mosquitoes that we have in BC. Um, you, I believe, have all, all of those here. Uh, so we have babies and Anopheles, Culex, we have some cattail mosquitoes, where they actually have a siphon and they drill right into cattails and they breeze from the center of the cattail. All mosquito larvae must be able to swim. They need standing water. So often they'll get lady, you're totally looking in the wrong spot. They're in the trees, they're in the grass. And again, they're talking about adults where we're always looking for mosquito larvae, which must be able to swim. It can't be just moist, spongy ground, they have to be able to swim. These guys grow about a centimeter in size. Well, where am I pointing at? Yes, there we go. And then they pupate. This is their cocoon stage. Once they're in this stage, they stop feeding. The products that we use to treat mosquitoes have to be applied in the larval stage while the mosquitoes are still feeding because they, they need to eat it. Once they hit this pupal stage, it's too late. They're no longer feeding. They start to develop. They go through and become go from a larvae, like a caterpillar. To an adult, but still in the water, those little horns sticking out the front, they 
set at the surface there and they breathe go and breathing air, they don't breathe in the water. And eventually that case will break open and they'll step out on the surface of the water as adults. Um, mosquitoes, kind of a fun fact about them, is the males tend to pupate first. So they'll pupate up to two days earlier than the females so that they're out and they're swarming around waiting for the females to emerge so they can bait as they emerge so that we chase them out later. So females are the ones that bite. You guys have heard that. They bite because they need that extra protein to develop their eggs. So they have to make the risky activity of going up to some kind of an animal, hopefully not getting swatted, and taking that blood meal. Males are actually pollinators of grasses. They go around eating sugar. They actually, some of them live for a very long time eating sugar, and they eventually die off. And like I said before, all larvae require standing water. Even like a cattle footprint. In sycamores, I personally identified 25 different species over the years that we've been here. There's probably more in the surrounding areas. I've identified up to 42 different species. Um, all of these species uh, kind of have different habit habits. So females are very selective on what they're willing to bite and where they're willing to lay their eggs. So, for example, we have some species here that will only bite birds. We have some species that you'll often see them first thing in the spring, and I'll get calls every single March about this. They kind of show up right at dusk, and they're big, and they'll sniff you for a really long time. Those ones actually overwintered as adults, and they prefer large animals, like horses and cattle and stuff, but if you, they sniff you for a really, really long time, they'll eventually bite you. So people call me then, and they're like, this is where we at. Something's going to be a terrible year. <laughs> like, no, that one's sucked over. It's nothing to do with what's going to happen. So big animal biters like horse biters. And we have a species here that only bites frogs. And typically only male frogs because only males sing and they're actually attracted to their song. Females are also very specific about where they lay their eggs. So we have some, um, especially more towards catnips that really like those sulky saline type ponds, aggressive, horrible species. Some really like polluted areas in the ditches like, so there's a lot of agriculture, like some of the dairy farms, very specific species like those kind of areas. And then we have ones that are our blood water mosquitoes. And those are our biggest nuisance here. And they are lay their eggs in the soil, water from the Shuswap River, and the Eagle River rises, wets the eggs, wets lots and lots of eggs at once. They all develop very quickly, especially when it's hot, like it was this May, and then emerge, and they're very aggressive. Actually, kind of general meters, most of them. They like humans, dogs, birds. Hmm. Um, so, in the trapping over the years here, and this we've done this by just going outside, the majority of our species are those 80s of feto, the ones that lay their eggs in the soil, the blood water species. Uh, the most common species here are 80 Stichticus and 80 Vexans. They're common throughout the province. They're the notorious human biting blood water mosquitoes. Like I said, the eggs become wet when the waters rise. Larvae can develop sometimes as long as 14 days. Like if we had this weather this spring, we would have had easy, maybe 14 to 21 days to treat those mosquitoes because they would be basically flipping in the water very slowly. Instead, we had searing, searing hot and pain. And so they are eating very quickly. It's all weather dependent, eating very quickly and developing very quickly. So five days, 10 days, depending on how deep the water was. Um, and then adults in the emerging class. The nice thing about these guys is a lot of times I'll get calls and people are very concerned when they're being bit that they're gonna get sick, right? So do consider, if I say West Nile virus is being endemic here. The mosquitoes that are those really aggressive ones, those floodwater mosquitoes, they emerge, they bite once typically, lay their eggs and die. So you have to think about if you're a mosquito that's going to transmit disease, you'll be able to bite more than once. You'll be able to bite, get the disease, have it transferred from your gut into your bloodstream and into your salivary glands until you're going to feed again and regurgitate and pass that on. So you do have species that do that here. Most of those species that do that prefer birds, which is how West Nile virus gets transmitted in bird populations. But they're typically in very low numbers. Okay, They're not these ones that are causing a nuisance. So skin control. 
So major components of the program are identifying habitats, monitoring the habitats. Um, so that includes like the river and the lake levels. We watch them all the time online where the levels are on the river forecast center. We monitor the weather so we know kind of what's coming next. We monitor it because we know that it's going to influence water levels, but also could impact our helicopter plans if it's too windy or too wet or basically too windy or too wet. And then we obviously treat them. We treat them by hand, we treat them by hand. Uh, so COVID is small, but we've mapped about 250 habitats in this program. And the program runs from Chuswap Lake to the Canby Colt Schools, Colt Canby Colt Bridge. And like one little site just past the bridge. Um, so along that river, we have, and it's mainly old oxbows that fill up. So you can see a lot of the habitats kind of look like little squirrels all the way along the river, right to the bridge. There's a couple in town, but they're quite small and they're not real big sources of so our monitoring field is done with this super fancy cup. They have to be ordered all the way from California, sticks on the end of a stick, gets a 300 ml yogurt cup. And we dip the water and count how many larvae are in there. So here's a typical, actually that dip was from here, uh, typical dip count that we would see in most of our floodwaters around here, just after as the water's rising. So anywhere from 200 to about 1,500 larvae in a 300 ml cup. Super high numbers. The product that we use and all products in BC use is called, uh, the product we're using is Aquabac. There's another one called Vectobac. It's like Heinz versus Kraft. It all has the same active ingredient, Bacillus thuringiensis is relentless, and it's all attached to the corn cob. So it looks like this. You can often get the liquid, you don't use it. It'd be really nice if we could with drones someday, but so far the camera ray is blocking that for us. But anyway, so it sticks to corn cob. The corn cob is just ground up corn, so it's a safe carrier, and it's just a way for us to. That's all. Just be great in one way. We treat by backpack blowers, so it's like a reverse leaf blower, and we treat, so that's what these guys are doing. Uh, you fill up the back and you shoot it out so we confirm the larvae are there, put on waders, and get whatever we can from the ground. Then when the water is too high, there's too much at once, the larvae are developing quickly, and we can no longer access everything properly, then we treat to helicopter applications. So this is actually June 6th. Friends, that's just use this field in order to load our helicopters. Helicopter comes in, got a great big fertilizer spreader. Helicopter is sitting just on the bottom. We can put in so eight times, you guys like kilograms, eight times 20 kilograms in it. So 160 kilos of the product. And then it can treat about 40 hectares per load. And then what it looks like on the surface of the water, you can see all the little white dots in there. You don't need much. And those little filter feeding larvae are doing this all day long, day and night, they're just eating tubes and really the bacteria. So when they eat that bacteria, it goes into their gut. Um, inside a mosquito's gut is actually a very high pH. So if you remember back in biology, most of the organisms that we have around here, including us, have a low pH stomach. So the first thing is, is we can't dissolve the crystal that is the toxin. So it can't affect us. But there are some other insects that do have a high pH gut, so they can dissolve the crystal. But once it's dissolved, it attaches to receptors in the mosquito's gut that the other organisms don't have. And once it attaches to the receptors, it punches holes in their gut and they become they die of sepsis. So what this means, at least this mechanism of action, is very, very specific to mosquito larvae. So we you know if I have much higher application rates than we use that are legally allowed on the label, it can affect some coronamids. It can affect, they use it in greenhouses for like gnats and green tomatoes, but where we're applying it, very specific to just the mosquito larvae. So, because some people are always concerned and fair enough about what is the effect on the environment. So, how kind of a statement on it? That BTI only becomes toxic in the stomachs of mosquitoes, black fly larvae. By the way, we don't treat black fly larvae because they live in running water. And so we can't throw those granules in running water. They take off less. There's likely to be fish in running water. And under the Ministry of Environment rules, we can't treat fish bearing waters that are permanently, or waters that are permanently contiguous with fish bearing. 
So when the waters rise and then go back down, that water that we're treating will have broken off. So that's why we can treat areas during the rise knowing that we'll be breaking off. The risk posed by BT strains to non target organisms is minimal to non existent. Insecticidal toxin biodegrades quickly in the environment through exposure to sunlight microorganisms. That's also important to us because basically, after about 24 to 48 hours, whatever we've applied is no longer working. So the floor keeps rising and more eggs keep hatching. Right back at square one. So this year, we started monitoring the first treatments from May the 3rd. We've had two helicopter applications so far, one on May 26, about 200 hectares, and one on June 6, about 240 hectares. Um, up until June 6, it looks like they haven't been entering their data since then. They're running around with the adults out there. Uh, there was over 250 records, so monitoring and or treatment records in our database. So a lot of work, a lot of visiting the same sites over and over. And the total larvicide that's been applied up to June 6, so including those two helicopter days, was 2,400 or 740 kilograms. This is the Eagle River this year. So the dark blue is this year, though the other lines were from other years. So the take home with this is the highest peak was actually May 6. And if you look at the graph, then there was another peak that was like this much lower. So there was kind of two almost identical peaks, but the highest was on May 6, which is about three weeks earlier than normal, um, which is the average peak for the Eagle Rivers around May 29th each year. The height of that peak was very near average, although it was slightly above. It did last for a long time, though, and it did come up. It's a lot, like there was a, the dip down, but over those three weeks, we had high water pretty consistently. Shoe Swap Lake also peaked about two and a half hour or two and a half peaks earlier than normal. So usually two peaks around June 17th. It peaked back on May 30th, but its peak was actually quite high. It's about 60 centimeters higher than normal. So that translates into a significant amount of area. Pretty much once you break the, the beach, the top of the beach, even a few centimeters, a large area. And it was hot. So right now we're finding quite high adult numbers, especially in the trees, anywhere where they can get away from the heat, um, harborage areas. So mosquitoes, once they're, if they're exposed to a lot of heat, they'll die quite quickly as adults. If they aren't, like today, it stayed like this for a while, then they will never die. But if we can get that heat back again, that's when it knocks them back. This has happened to me here before, where it started like this at the beginning of June and did that right into August. Mm -hmm. But if we can get some normal weather, um, they'll start kind of dying off. We are rarely finding larvae now, and even if we are, they're very low counts, one to five larvae per dip, treating them. Habitats are drying up, which makes them a lot more accessible for us. So that's good. Hopefully the rain doesn't do, do us too much damage. It usually doesn't. Um, and then like I said, hopefully we'll get some sustained hot, dry weather again after we have this much needed rain, and that should not come back pretty quick. Wow, Council, any questions about mosquito school? Council yeah, sure. McKay. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, 101 in mosquitoes. Uh, very informative. I'm just wondering how your contract's structured. Um, is it by the kilograms of stuff you put out or by, or? Um, no. How, could you explain how your contract's structured? Uh, yes, we and, have as far as a budget for a, a set amount of hours, which is typically enough to run um, two people full-time and two people half-time through uh, most of the summer. Uh, we have a budget of at least 15 hours for helicopter time. Uh, the large site is provided by the district so that I don't purchase it. There's the reason is, is um, some of the people that sell the other the vendors of the large site are also mosquito control people. So if they can bundle it in their contract, there's a kind of fair advantage there. So that is purchased separately. So what have I got? And mileage. And you're just charged mileage on our vehicles. So hours, mileage. And so if it's an absolute insane year and we're run off our feet, we get basically the same pay as here's if it's nice and the river doesn't even come at all. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Councillor Rich. Uh, through the chair. Thank you for coming. That was neat. Um, 
So do we have a set number, like do we get 60 hours a week of, of people out in the field or? This year has actually been challenging for staff. We had one girl that got called away to fires and we had have a guy who's become quite ill. Um, but it's not a set number of hours. So because of how mosquito control works and it's completely dependent on the weather, completely dependent on, on river levels, there may be weeks where they're working seven days and they're working really long days and starting at five in the morning. And then when the summer gets a little bit later on, they'll take days off, they'll bank their hours and come August is quite, quite slow. So we respond to what the need is out there as a help. Thank you, Councillor Bushell. Yes, through the chair. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that presentation, Cheryl. That was really, uh, really informative. Um, as councillors, we get our, our uh, you know, people call us quite a, quite a few times. And this year with mosquitoes, I, I've had a, quite a few calls. And I know our community's a little different. We have lots of water lot, and lots, water, lots of hardware. Yeah. And I understand the weather and all, all that that went on this year. Um, you know, I, we increased our budget $10,000 this year um, to 130000 like on a small community that's, and I know you do probably do this in other areas. Um, is that normal, like roughly around, you know, with rivers and lakes like we have? You actually, because of the nature of your program and the history of it is that there was a really bad mosquito year back in 2012. And so the council at that time mandated how many people had so those numbers that are in that of how many hours per year, the helicopter hours, or whatever, were selected by the council at that time. So then my job is to supply the people to use those hours as needed. And every year we do tend to come in, unless it's a really bad year, we typically don't use them all, but we have that budget there in case. Of yeah. Yeah. Just curious some more for, for budgeting purposes as we move forward. Yeah. Thank you. Carol, Councillor Bailey. Thank you very much. That's got to be one of the most informative presentations I've had since I've been on council. I, I actually really enjoyed that. I learned a whole bunch of stuff today about mosquitoes that I never really wanted to learn, but actually I'm really glad that I learned, but I, I hate these things. I, they drive me absolutely crazy. And my, I must have that blood type where I literally just stand beside me and they'll just bite me and uh, leave everybody else alone. <laughs> I <did not>. um, <laughs> I, so maybe just a, a, a a couple of quick questions is, I, I, you know, I guess the first one, since you're the expert, is there anything more that we should or could be doing to kind of avoid the situation that we're in now? Or is this just, it's just, it's just the way it is. It is. It's the way it is. They will die. I think, um, I do think they must have, been, we thought it was going great. Right. This was kind of a little bit of a surprise. Like we were not finding pupae, we were treating, so I actually, yeah. So to show you where helicopter applications were, it was perfectly timed just after the peak. So no more eggs are being wet. They were beautiful third in star mosquitoes. Um, the same thing after that second peak. So they were able to keep it under control. We came, we hit it right after those maximum number of mosquitoes. Uh, the staff are out there, like I say, every day monitoring, telling you what stage they're at. So all I can think, there's a couple of things that could have come at play is when it's not a crazy high year like this, sometimes you get like seepage coming up, right? And so places where you wouldn't know or wouldn't normally find water, possibly that happened here. And those, because I was tweeting out at Scotch Creek a week and a half ago, and I've busted into the trees only because I've been doing it for long enough and I know where the water is. Because if you normally you can stand on the road and see the habitat, but there was none. It looked dry. I'm like, well, I know that there's a low spot way back there. So busted through, climbed over a bunch of trees, and sure enough, there was a puddle about the size of this, which is literally nothing, except for that it had about six thousand larvae per dip in it. It was, and they were big already. It was like this deep, so really hot. So th that could have played a part. Maybe that's what happened here. Maybe there were some of these little puddles that we wouldn't normally know. They'd be usually big habitats. So you'd walk and be like, oh, there they are. So I, and definitely the fact that things were developing very quickly with that heat spell. But I don't, one of the benefits is if we can get back to the warmth, it is early, very early in the year for this outbreak. Usually it's kind of closer to 
uh, July long weekend. So maybe we'll have nice little dog up quickly in sometime in June and July and August when everybody shows up, we should be good. And just yep. another quick question, just um, that's really good information. So when people come to us and ask us about it, uh, what type of hope can we give them? Uh, it kinda, it, it, it just basically hope for hot weather and that should kind of resolve in two, three weeks. Like there's yeah, okay. big waves coming, there are a few, but we can get those. Yeah. There's no giant waves coming anymore. There's definitely they need to be wearing their insect propellant, something with deep net. They won't bite with it. Um, and if we can get the hot weather again, that typically starts to happen near the end of June. Hot and hot. So it's going down from here. Our standing <laughs> water that maybe we don't know about too. The pro program can, is changes every year. So we're always adding sites to it. Someone's like, hey, I just bought this property and I, I don't know if you guys know about this, but there's water that comes into my backyard. And so we go and look and yeah, and add it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Go ahead, Councillor Edge. Through the chart. So is there a website then? So if I bought a piece of property, I find water, then who do, do I contact? Who so most I contact? And do is there some somewhere? How did you do that? Not me personally, but go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, through the chair. I, I think it's 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 a great idea. And I, I think maybe we should make it known, maybe get some messaging out and I can work on something. There's something on your website. Mm -hmm. Your website has a phone number. I think it has my phone number on it. Well, maybe you know, a standalone or something on social yeah. media. Just if you have standing water in your in your yard, let us know. Yeah, so, absolutely. Good idea. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, do we have? Are we doing mosquito? Do we have a Coles notes to share with with residents on social media about this and that it's on its way down and the sun's going to shine and. <laughs> Good time, it's not going to burn everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sarah? Okay. We were discussing this, and we will put together some information to share with the public. That's excellent. Maybe we can include Daryl's stuff on that, too, as, as with Cheryl's contact information. Perfect. Any other questions? Go ahead, Brian. Bringing back lots of money. Getting away from your people that get in there, and stagnant water. The only way you get at that is that water. Yeah, it is. Well, they, I mean, will bust in as much as they can, but that's, you can start seeing our escapes. That's why we get the helicopter up because we know that whatever we're seeing and whatever we can access is not going to be all of it. But when Katie, our helicopter pilot, gets up there, she can use it. Well, she can always see a lot more. And it's always great to see the staff come out of the helicopter after they're wrecking going, oh, because they just had. They've been busting and busting and busting and think they're getting it, and they get in the helicopter. No, it just went like so much further. <laughs> so, the yeah. helicopter is really important. Awesome. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for being here today, and thanks for sharing all that with us. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move along here. Sigma's Fire Department update. Welcome, Chief. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was a, a great presentation on mosquitoes. That was yeah, well, that's <laughs> a lot of information. I was just going to give me one second. I just when I came up, I lost my report. So, uh, you tend to give you a bit of an update as to what's going on with the department, a few stats, uh, a little bit about the membership, step by members. Uh, Things such as that, and um, get going with it. Uh, so it's been a fairly busy spring. Uh, so we're kind of looking at the last roughly a quarter of, of the year. Um, we've uh, had nine calls in March, which included our first uh, grass fire, and I think that's probably the earliest we've had a grass fire in in, in the fire department, uh, which kind of didn't bode really well. Uh, from what, uh, from what we were gathering, it was because of the hotter winter. Uh, everything froze up pretty quick and hard, and uh, a, a very dry winter, and certainly a significantly dry spring. That, that caused us a lot of grief, that's for sure. A uh, bunch of trees uh, and, and uh, grass areas. The first fire that we went to in March uh, was roughly 200 feet by 50. Uh, that's quite a fairly good sized fire for us to. To get onto, and uh, fortunately, we were able to get the corral and put out. Um, April, 
We had 10 calls in service, again, more uh, grass fires. Uh, the, the next grass fire that we had was about 1,000 feet by 200. Um, started going to trees, started catching trees on fire, we had the trees cattling. <coughs> Definitely a concern for the crew, and it was started by a gentleman who just decided to burn a little bit of grass along the fence. Uh, thought it was all out, and unfortunately, it wasn't. It, it, it did stay on his property. It did catch up in the tree. We spent a couple of days dealing with the tree that had, had burned up inside the core, but uh, it did end up as, as all taken care of. Uh, May was quite uh, quite busy as well. We had a number of grass fires again, uh, burning complaints. Um, so we were kept fairly busy there. Um, and we had four days in May where we had multiple call-outs, uh, at least two call-outs per day. Uh, a couple of them, we had three call-outs in a day, and it was all a variety of different calls, everything from uh, false alarms to actual uh, lease system malapol with a fairly significant structure fire uh, that kept us busy for quite a number of hours. Uh, our numbers are uh, at 26. Uh, with that, though, there's kind of a caveat. Uh, four of the members work out of the community, so we only have them when they are in the community. Um, and then uh, you know, three summer students, uh, and obviously they'll be gone in the fall. We have hired our full time fire smart coordinator, so that's a, a definite success story there. We received our grant, um, so we'll be, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, we did send a truck up to Fort St. John for uh, just over a week. So they were had a pretty good experience uh, working with a bunch of different crews in a bunch of different areas there. Uh, the, and our older engine managed to generate a little bit of revenue as well, so that was good. Um, significant rain helped deal with that particular issue. Uh, for myself, I've been told that I'm going to Edmonton maybe today. I'm not sure if it's I'm going to or not. So kind of that uh, challenge of working around wildfire. Uh, they, they did get a significant amount of rain in the Edmonton area, so hopefully that's uh, that's not going to be a problem, and they get to say, oh, don't bother, you're not needed. That's my kind of call. So, <laughs> um, as far as uh, our grant, so we received $108,000 for the Fire Park Community Funding and Support. It's a bit of a mouthful, so FCFS program, uh, so that was a grant, and that helps pay for our fire smart coordinators position and our four fire smart crew members. Uh, they will be pretty much getting active. Uh, they're starting on Monday the 19th. I was hoping to start them a little bit earlier, but uh, again, uh, getting everything all sorted out, getting everybody hired has been a bit of a challenge, but uh, we do have a good, good looking crew by the looks of things. And, uh, They'll be spending the first part of their, their time doing training and getting familiarized with the Fire Smart program. And then uh, we'll start working with the district staff on coordinating with uh, the media messaging and, and uh, getting them out there and out into, into the community. Uh, as far as financial implications, um, basically because it's, those positions are fully funded by the grant, uh, Fire Smart coordinator will be with us till at least December and uh, the crew will be here for the time. Council, any questions? Councilor Evans. Beat you by that one. I did. <laughs> Councilor Bush was right, right behind. Yeah. Chief, did we hire somebody for that position? It says we got the grant for a fire for fire smart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't catch the question. Did we hire somebody? Yes. Uh, we just finished hiring. Uh, so, Travis Lansing is our new fire smart coordinator. Um, and same with the crew. Uh, two of them are firefighters from the department. Uh, two are people that we're not as familiar with, but are known in the community, and uh, we're looking forward to getting them out there. And for council, if you have people that are you know concerned about the wildfires and what's been going on in the media, I mean it's it's there every single day. Um, if people are saying, you know, what can we do? What can we do? Let them know. Hey, the fire department. Getting our fire smart crew up and running, and uh, they'll be starting to go into the community a little bit different this year than past, where previously we would go in and do the work for the, the community members, and it was geared towards seniors, disabled, disadvantaged people. This year we're focusing more on curbside pickup, so it's available to everybody. So if you've gone in and said, "Okay, I'm going to clear out some branches out of my area," 
phone call into the district, our crew will come in and help them move them. It's a great program. Councilor Rich. Through the chair. So we have 26 members, four that come and go. What what is a good number? Like what what number do you like to be at? I, I don't know anything. For, for department? Yeah. I'd love to be at 30. 30. The reality is it's a small community, it's fairly seasonal. And uh, people in general, this is across the industry as, as far as uh, you know, volunteer fire departments go or paid on call fire departments, everyone is struggling. Uh, not only is it pretty evident and you know for businesses and employers, but take that and say, well, we're only going to pay a, a very little amount. We're going to ask a lot of you for training, and we want a lot of your time. A lot of folks kind of go, eh, not for me. Okay. It's, a, it's a tough thing. Tough sell. Thank you. Councillor Bushel. To the chair. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, great job, Brett, on getting that grant. That's uh, that's wonderful to get that, be able to have five people on, uh, extra people around the community to help out. So kudos to you guys. Um, yeah, I always wondered about that magic number as well. And uh, I know it's probably, I kind of said before, and I wondered if, is there any possible way we could offer benefits to the, to the, to the volunteers, you know, that are, that are full-time volunteers? And it might attract more people. I'm not sure, but it might cost us a little, little bit, little bit more as well. But that's always a, a, a struggle. I know you've always struggled to get to the get to that uh, number you wanted. But no, other than that, that's just really good job uh, picking up that grant. And uh, uh, kudos to your crew. You guys do a lot of great work in the community, and we want to thank you for everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think one of the, the big advantages of getting this grant was we're able to bring people who are within the fire department on full time. So that makes us more capable with our response and our fire department coordinator being uh, a full-time position until at least December. Um, that gives us an additional person who is available, focused and, and able to respond to, to not just the fire department phone calls, but also page outs and, phone and radio responses as well. Quite pleased with the response there. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it is a terrible fire season, and and a big thank you, Brett, for you know obviously being flexible, going up to Fort Saint John now, maybe Edmonton. I think it's it's really important that we help out communities that are struggling because we were there a couple of years ago, and I think that's a very important thing for us to remember. These wildfires are, you know, there there's no rhyme reason or any really controlling them, they they take off now so fast. Um, and I, I, that kind of leads into, you know, one of the questions it wasn't really part of your report, but you've done a lot of mitigation work around town and and burning the slash and and the you know a lot of the dead material. And I know that was was uh, provided. You're able to do that through grants that you've got. And I'm just wondering where we stand with that, whether looking forward, we have the ability to continue to do that. Cause I think it's awfully important for the town to, you know, where we can get a bigger buffer as we possibly can so that we don't end up with something like a Lytton or, or other terrible examples like that. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you uh, through the chair. It's, it's been, a pretty important thing in my mind that we you know, do these these additional bits of work. Um, the grant funding is really important. Uh, there are programs that the province and ministry of forest have as well, but one of them is called wildfire risk reduction. And fortunately, it's a gentleman that I'm, uh, I'm familiar with from uh, Baldwin who runs that program in out of Vernon. So uh, we'll be working through him, uh, working collaboratively with the CFRD and City of San Juan with our fire smart programs. But the fuel management component uh, is always something that we're, we're looking to see if we can expand on it, improve on it. Uh, you know, we've been lucky and unlucky that we've had some pretty good um, timber practices. It's always been a little bit of a concern about doing logging in visible areas. And I thought that the work that the folks did working with uh, BCTS, uh, BC Timber Sales, and uh, you know the grant work that was done tied together fairly well. And it doesn't look terrible across that hillside. And there's some pretty good uh, you know, clearing areas that uh, give us better protection for sure. The fire provided us with a, a huge fire guard, kind of unintentionally, but they Thank you, Brett. Awesome, thank you very much, Brett. I love the Fire Smart um, program. 
because, you know, preventative maintenance, right? So that's great that you're doing curbside pickup. I do have a question for staff and uh, Brett, perhaps. We were very close, not before they put, before Kamloops put the um, fire ban in. We as council were very close to wanting to put a fire ban in the district of Sycamus. Do we have that ability to do that? And what's the process? So as a municipality, we have the ability to make decisions about the municipality and what we wish to have in the area. Um, it's challenging uh, because people tend to, and we've tried to put on you know fire bans when the province changed it. And, and uh, what I've found through working with BC Wildfire Services, and, and they have a lot of science behind what <clears throat> decisions that they make, but they also have manpower that helps them determine what they can and can't do. So when they bring on things like campfire bans, um, it's usually because they've got a lot of resources to put in other areas that are no longer available to fight, uh, immediately get to some of the fires that, that do pop up. Because they do deal with a lot of stuff that we don't really see. You'll see things pop up on the wildfire app and they've already got crews <clears throat> on and working on them and starting to put them out. Um, as they start running low on those resources, that's when they start looking at, okay, we need to put it on a campfire ban. And there's been some frustration where they'll put it on and they'll take it off and put it on and take it off. I, I think the biggest challenge is, is um, they have to look at what they feel they can attack with the resources that they have. And as long as not all of the resources are, you know, up in Fort St. John dealing with some of the big blazes up there, that's, it, it's a challenge. We, like I say, we have that ability um, messaging out to the public is the biggest challenge there. It's if we say we're putting this on, people go, well, I go to the ministry site and there's nothing there. How come we're putting it on and they're not? We have uh, burning bylaws, which do not allow people to do backyard burning after a certain period of time. When the weather's right, we don't really enforce it a whole lot because uh, most people will call me and say, hey, I want to do a burn. I'll go and take a look at it and say, okay, great. Make sure you got people there. Make sure you follow the rules for doing a burn. If uh, if it's hot like it has been, um, they're just going to be told no. It's you know there's no backyard burning right now. And they haven't by law that that enforces that. So yeah, I understand that. So what you're saying is, if we've got resources and it's still tender dry, but because we have resources, we're not going to put a fire ban on. Is that is that what I'm picking up? Yeah, BC Wildfire Service looks at it that way. Um, how we look at it is, uh, they're the ones who are going to be dealing with anything up in the up in the bush area. We have bylaws within our municipality that protect us. Uh, or, or if we are concerned about people doing backyard burning when it's hot. And start to get kind of neighbors down. Yeah. yeah, and even campfire burning, just uh, yeah, little campfires in your backyard. Um, I think that you know, I I heard a lot from the community as well as council, and we we're about ready to pull a pin on a fire ban. So I think that we should have that ability and be able to at at some point when we're sitting here going, holy, this is like tinder dry and they haven't pulled the pin or they haven't pulled the trigger in Kamloops. I'd like us to be able to pull the trigger here in the district of Sycamus. And perhaps that's sandwich boards that say fire ban, fire ban, or, you know, um, boards, reader boards, social media. But I would just like us to, to have that ability and it be on our radar screens. So if this happens again, where. Part of the challenge with that is, um, we're then kind of going out on our own. Um, and we don't have that media backing of saying, okay, the reason we're putting on fire. And I know the city of San Arm has done it, Kelowna's done it, mm -hmm. where they put on an early camp. And, it, and certainly we can't, we have that ability. But we only have that ability within the municipality. We don't have any powers outside of that. And that's where you start running into a bit of a challenge because people say, well, you know, my neighbor down the lake or across the lake is having a campfire. How come I can't? Right. And we've, we've run into that challenge in the past. I've found through experience, it tends to be a lot easier and a lot more sensible to follow what the province does. They have the science backing them rather than opinions of members of the public saying, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. Well, what's our danger rating? What's our, you know, 
moisture codes, what are concerns. Sure, uh, but again, it's not science, it's manpower that they're basing a, a fire ban on. So I still would like us, you know, to have a look, even if, even if Swansea Point or Area E doesn't, I like, like us to have that ability and have the um, process. Go ahead, Councillor Bailey. Sure, maybe I could suggest something. And since I think there was a high level of concern this year, maybe them being a little late, that we should... I mean, I, for lack of a, write something, uh, write a letter and ask for an explanation of their criteria and then explain from our perspective why we thought it was late and based on whatever data that we could muster to say here in this particular area uh, why it was late. I mean, they're dealing with a whole Kamloops fire area. So they're, they're, it's a fairly large area as well that they look at and then they say, okay, fire ban now. And, this entire area and correct me if I'm wrong, Brett. Yeah. So maybe that there could be something that we advocate here for that that fire area is maybe just a little too big because within that there are different isolated zones that might require a different look at. And I think that's what we're kind of saying at. We looked around the, the town, we looked around the general area. I think everybody understood that it was incredibly dry. And then maybe in certain other areas of this fire, um, Kamloops fire area, it wasn't like that. But uh, certainly for our town, we were concerned about it. I don't know, that just a suggestion about something we could maybe be proactive about and have a conversation leading up to next year. Yeah, that's a good idea. Go ahead, Councillor Beach. Something that, uh, sorry, oh, go, go, ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, something that uh, I look at is uh, on the BC Wildfire website uh, and their mapping is you have the ability to click on fire danger rating. And even though it's hot, even though there's certainly significant concerns, rain or, or other factors may have uh, calculated in. And um, when we see red, that's a concern to me if we're, we're not in campfire type ban situations. Well, typically because we're in Kamloops, Kamloops area is certainly much drier than us. So they'll start seeing those problem areas coming up way before we do. Um, a lot of times they'll have extreme fire hazard, fire danger rating, and we'll be moderate. And, and that was an example this spring is uh, we were moderate and they were, they had extreme. And then they put on the campfire map shortly after that. And we were still moderate, uh, which to me didn't really seem right. But like I say, I don't argue with the scientists guys. They, I don't know better. Councillor Beach. Oh yeah, I I am of the mind that that if we think it's dry enough to be worried about fires here, that we should have the ability to uh, indicate that that it's not a great idea. And I'm hoping that just bringing on a local fire ban, if that's all we can do, would would give people cause to actually think twice about starting a fire if they were somewhere where they thought no one was going to notice. I I don't know. It seems it seems odd that we would have to be controlled by. Um, I'm, I'm I'm a little jaded about disconnect. So through systems, right? So it seems odd that we would have to wait for it to be registered at a higher level as a hazard when we can logically see in our own community that it's very dry and we probably should not have fires. So I'm kind of agreeing with the mayor here um, that it makes more sense to, to us to put a fire ban on if, if we feel the area is dry and at risk. And yeah, people are going to say, well, why don't they have a fire ban on somewhere else? But some people will say, yeah, it's dry. We probably shouldn't start. We shouldn't light a fire. It just might prevent a fire. I don't know. Thanks, Pam. Councillor Bushel. Yes, through the chair, I, uh, I, I agree with Colleen and Pam. It's, uh, it is pretty dry out there. I actually, I was pulling a weed this morning <laughs> after all that that rain we had for the last, you know, overnight. And when I pulled it out, I looked and it was just powder. 
There was just, there was nothing there. Yeah. The ground is just like, it's, it's not even getting into the ground. But anyway, I, I tend to be proactive when, when, you, when you start talking about disasters, things that can happen. And I know I have a neighbor at the bottom of the hill there and uh, he's always having fires and he kind of concerns me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Councilor McCabe. I thought I should chime in on this. Um, I agree with the mayor that we should have at least a system in place that if 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 council agrees even by email that we, we should uh, pull the trigger and put a fire ban on, even if we don't get 100% compliance because we're not in, in sync with uh, the region or the province, uh, even if we stop, uh, you know, if we get 60% compliance, we're, we're, we're taking measures and we're trying. Uh, we're a small community. If we get it up in electronic boards and out on social media with an information officer, public communications and stuff, I, I think we get a pretty high rate of compliance. And uh, I, I think I think it's better to be proactive. Maybe it's not based on science, but we're a small community and we know our, our town. And so I think we should have sort of like a like an amber alert thing ready to go, push the buttons and then and then it, it hits the electronic billboard signs, it hits social media. We've got something to go if 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 we think it's required. Without uh, the data of science and everything, just common sense. Thanks, Councillor McCabe. Councillor Rich. Through the chair. But, and you would still be allowed to have a propane fire pit, right? Yeah, there's, there's restrictions on propane fire pits. Um, and this is where it's a bit of a challenge because people across the lake or even just the neighbors can't tell that it's a propane fire pit. Um, it's supposed to be no more than six inches above the rim. Nobody does it that way. It's always a foot or so. Uh, it seems to be the position of the plan. Um, and that makes it challenging. I, I honestly, I wish we could ban those because we spend a lot of time chasing propane fires that are campfire that are burning from plants. And uh, it's gotten better, but it's still a bit of a pain because people are allowed to have them. They just don't follow the rules. But anyway. Thanks, Brett. So, is council in favor of us putting together some sort of a uh... Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, can can you just leave it with staff? Yes. Do a little bit of research and then bring it back to you in terms of options for this, just to make sure. Sure. That sounds like a good it was idea. Staff, got it, investigate, and we'll we'll report back. Awesome. Yeah. It'll be next month, but in the next little bit, we're recognizing it'll it's for next fire season, but yeah. then the next chunk. Yeah. Perfect. Thank so you, Kelly. Here for the next two weeks, I think. Yeah, I can certainly do some conversations okay. with the uh, other communities and yeah. other other places that have put on their fire bans early. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's certainly nothing that says we can't. Perfect. There's reasons that we try to follow the products, but uh, we're little trendsetters here in Sycamus. <laughs> <laughs> we're not into we're gonna do what we want to do. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Brett. All right, um, Daryl, operations manager update. Go. Yeah, I've got a little bit in the way of some visuals. We've actually got a really good communication team and a pretty high level of tech savvy in, in this office. <laughs> You'll see that I'm kind of closing the gap. This is my <laughs> features in this one. Features. Oh, Features. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so this will be fairly quick. We did this just, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, but I want to keep you posted on some of the pieces that are in motion. And I brought up last time that I wanted you to think about some stuff, and they'll be coming back. So I'm back. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so just really quickly, we're into our fourth cycle of mowing throughout the town. We try to get everything once a week. Ditch flailing's been completely done once. We have an A route and a B route, so they're done. We'll be doing that every Monday. Planting flowers, we're probably closer to 99% now because a few more went in today. Uh, we've got all of our irrigation system operating and set timers are set. Um, we, we boost them or we knock them back as the weather dictates. 
We've uh, undertaken some waterline flushing that's going on right now, and lift station cleaning is going on. We've got some flowers popping up everywhere. We've got a, a new variety of marigold in the middle of the spark. It's going to look really good. This year. For this early in the year, I'm, I'm encouraged. I think that's going to look really, really good this year. Uh, so you've seen the, the roundabout tree. We've got some stuff down by the waterfront. We've got tomatoes in there. That's one of my graphics. <laughs> it's good. That's very good. impressive. Good. Uh, we were going with uh, some options here. This is from the daycare. This is this is from the brochure. It represents the playground that was at the daycare that we purchased back in 2018. As part of the grant, a uh, bunch of rentals were done. A playground was put in. The playground now that they're expanding their services is not appropriate. It's not age appropriate for the for the little ones. It's too high. It's too dangerous. It needed to come out. So the operator of the daycare had asked the district if we could take it out for them. And he had no use for it. Before I go any further, I'll start throwing some graphics. <laughs> well, look at no. Yeah, so. Whoever really, really likes playgrounds, does all day. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to come out. So we've we've taken it out and we've got it in our backyard at PW. So it's been extracted. We didn't wreck anything. It can go to another home or be used. So two points from our disposal policy, and we have a couple of options here uh, for this playground. We can take it as staff and see what we can fetch for it in the market, trying to maximize financial return. So we would, you know, put it up for sale, see what we get for bids. Or under Section 4A, Council and CAO have the authority to approve an alternate process. So if we look at something like, and we know the elementary school has been planning and saving and trying to get a playground, if we look at that as a unique opportunity to help out somebody in the community, that choice could be made as well. So um, we have it and I'm just seeking some direction on whether we want to put it to market, if we wanna maybe look at nonprofits within the community and get any expressions of interest that, you know, see who wants it. And maybe we could do a little scoring matrix to see, you know, have they taken steps to acquire one? How long have you wanted one? How many kids would play on it? We could do some kind of a little a waiting and then come back with a recommendation if you like. Did you want us to share some ideas now? Absolutely, yeah. Council? Direction. Councilor McCabe and Councilor Rich. Yeah, What? so it didn't meet the standards for um, zero to three or whatever, age group or whatever. So if we went to the elementary school, would it meet the code for the elementary school? So I can't speak to that specifically, although they are, they know this playground and they they are interested in it. So I'm assuming it's it's okay. okay. And, and my second question would be, uh, I guess that little Lions Park we have on is it Martin or Temple? I forget which. Yeah. Um, would it be suitable in there? There's some small play structures in there already. It's there's not a lot of room there. There's really not a lot of room there. Okay. Thank you. One place, sorry, the one place I did think it, it might work was um, right by the caboose there, that little exercise, not exercise, the little playground right to, by the rec center entrance. But there's tons of little kids that play there as well, so it's not appropriate for that. Councilor Rich. Through the chair, um, I'm just going to say I, I really feel like it should go to Parkview. Um, they fund like raise like crazy. The kids use that playground throughout the year. There's no school gates on there. You can go after school. You can go Saturday. You can go August 3rd. Um, so, and it is uh, the right age group for this elementary school um, because kindergartners uh, start at five and go up. So it's safe for that area. Um, and I would think it would be fabulous, in my opinion, that that's where it goes. Thanks, Councillor Rich. Councillor Bushell. The chair, I agree with. Uh, I think. Uh, I think it's. Uh, you know, I, I, that was included in that grant, anyways, was it not, uh, Daryl? Yes. Yeah. So I, I do think that for sure it should just we should uh, donate it to the, the Parkview for sure. 
Councillor Bailey. Yeah, I, I like the idea of Park View. My only concern was as long as people can access it after school hours and it is generally understood that the public can access it. I, I think that's a great location and find a useful second home. Councillor McCabe. I, li I like the idea of Park View, but maybe we can horse trade. <laughs> Uh, we got our pickleball courts that we're going to upgrade uh, some tennis courts up to pickleball. And don't we need some little additional parking there adjacent to the school, the high school? So it's the school board we're giving it to, not Parkview Elementary, really. So maybe we could get some parking at the pickleball courts if we get playground. Sure. Um, if we do or if we don't, I still think Parkview is a really yeah, good idea. We're not going to hold them hostage. <laughs> no, <but I'm>, no. <laughs> I think, Daryl, I think. <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Beach. <laughs> I am throwing it out there. I thought you were going to want little kids to paint the lines on the tennis court. <laughs> no, fetch the ball. <laughs> I do. I do think that it would be appropriate to donate it to yeah, Park uh, Parkview School if they're interested in it. Yeah, that's your answer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, Corey. Oh. Can I just interact? And just because this is a uh, dispute, like a. Can I just get a little resolution? I've, I've got one here and I just... Councillor Rich? Oh. I'm... That council directs staff to work with Parkview Elementary and donate the old daycare uh, playground. Okay. Will you make that motion? Yes, Something I make like that. that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I make that motion. <laughs> Councillor McCabe seconds it. Okay. All in favor? Motion carried. Thank you, Kelly. Yep. Not fully consistent, so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, we did some uh, rehab work in our rapid infiltration basins. Two of them got skimmed. This one, quite aggressively, we, we took down good three or four inches right across it to, to promote drainage at our water plant. This is after five days of loading, so it's it's performing admirably. So good news item, anyway. We had fouling in those earlier, and they were not draining as well as we'd hoped, so, so that's good. So on that topic, this water treatment facility, we have finally commissioned all the new equipment that was put in over the last number of years. This filter testing uh, was done two weeks ago and we hit it at full capacity, which is 2000 cubes per day. Um, and like I said, the RIB rehab work is, is working really well. We have already received a permit, a new permit from Ministry of Environment. Uh, not going to lie, a little disappointed. We we built to two thousand cubes per day, and this has been an effort that's taken a number of years and a lot of persistence to get to that point. They've granted us an increase of ten percent from where we used to be, so they're giving us twelve forty eight. So at this point, we are going to work in the background as hard as we can to try to get our number up. So that's where we are with that. Thank you. I've got a couple of designers that pump tracks and they are coming out by the end of the month they want to come and have a little site meeting so i will be sending an email out and in, any interested parties want to come and do a little walk around over in finlayson field a couple of spots we want to look at and obviously a couple of different options for tracks and um, we have a local that's designed some tracks and uh, he wants to do that as well so oh uh, just one second yeah. councillor mccabe are you trying to get a design that's uh, to a standard for a circuit so they get credits or, you know, or we're part of a circuit? Yeah, so, so, so it's really tough to know what comes first. Like, I, in my mind, I want to get out there with the designers and see what we have for options for different spaces. So we've kind of thought, you know, maybe behind the caboose might be big enough for a nice community track, but it might not be big enough for something that's going to get a circuit. And along the side further in, we can do something bigger. Let's see what we have for options for size, and then we can kind of marry it up with what our expectations are for the, the type of track. Makes sense. Thank you. Good plan. Um, you. So, yeah, that'll be by the end of the month. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the 29th, I think, but I'll, I'll confirm a time and get some invites out. As some of you probably noticed, no way to work or wherever you go. <laughs> We've got a new speed on Old Town Road. Uh, had to be done. We were getting lots of new driveways on the hillside and the access permits come in. We have to go review them. And there just comes a point where you're either telling somebody that wants a driveway, 
you need to knock off half of the mountain here so we can see further. We're trying to meet the tax standards for sight lines. So really, you know, it's, it's, it's lifting trees and it's trying to get the right angle of approach. And then there's a part that we have to play as well. And that's just, we're at a point where we have to take the speeds down. And 10K makes a big difference for- It does, distance. it does. And I, I travel that road a few times a day. So I am quite aware of the new speed limit. And you know, it takes, it, it doesn't take any longer. You really. have to leave early. And you know what? As I'm driving down at 40 now, I'm enjoying the scenery a little bit more. It's not like, not that I was speeding down that road before, because I wouldn't. 30 if you prefer. Exactly. I like to dawdle. Um, so, no, it's working fine. Okay. So hopefully it's safer all along that corridor going forward. A couple of little things from the last meeting. We did get a sign up at the dog park, uh, and AIM has been contacted regarding the dangerous trees on 97 and the potholes. So I'll be following. Perfect. Thank you. Yesterday. Councillor McCabe. Thank you for the very quick response when I signed at the dog park. I've, I've got uh, a lot of good compliments about the about not only putting up, but putting it up in a, a speedy fashion. So uh, it, it shines good on council, but it's really staff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah, thank you. And that aim is looking after those, uh, looking at those potholes as well and and danger. What are those trees? Danger trees. Danger trees. Danger trees. Awesome. Does anyone have any more questions for Daryl before we move on? Okay, Councillor Bailey. Yeah, I just have a one because I can't remember. I, I, I know you told us the figure that we're at for the wastewater treatment, kind of where we're yeah. maxing out like in the summertime, but what was that again? How much? So, so the did? permit that as it exists now. Yeah. So we were at 11.35, they've moved it up to 12.48. Okay. The 12.48 cubes per day were permitted to discharge. And where are we with the capacity level or kind of on peak time? So yeah, 10 months of the year, it's not an issue. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's getting busier now and we're probably around, I don't know, if I look today, it'd be 900. Right. Okay. right? So we'll hit a thousand, we'll hit 1100. We've bounced off well. Okay. Yeah. So um, 2020 was a really <laughs> weird year because we had several exceedances that year. And then the next year, I think we had one, one or two. So before that, we had zero. You know, we're nowhere close, but we're ten percent. We needed to grab that, and now we need to get more. Great, thanks, Daryl. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Bushell. Thank you, through the chair, uh, Daryl. Just quick question on the banners. You, I, I have you worked out the banner pro program? Yeah, they're up, they're up, through the chair. They're actually sitting on my desk. And I've, I've got them ready to go out. So we're talking the painted ones? Uh, both. Well, I, I think you've- Yeah, so most of the- uh, Marketing, the branded banners are out already. And the painted ones, we've picked some spots. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Good, thank you. Sue so, Bennett. Yeah, sorry. And this is just a follow-up on the wastewater treatment plant capacity. In the in the winter months, like what is it about six hundred, and we bump up to twelve hundred? Is it double kind of, or is it more? Yeah, between six and eight through the winter. Okay. Yeah, six, seven, eight. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on. Old Town Road Civic Addressing Consultation. Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to share some information with you the whole. Uh, about a consultation plan that staff has regarding addressing in the Old Town Road area. Oops. So a little bit of background on this. So the district received an application for a subdivision. Regular this arrow is here at the zero zero Old Town Road. And the reason that this property is called zero zero is because there are no single address numbers left to provide a proper address for this property. Um, we're anticipating that this subdivision will complete this year so for lending and addresses. Um, so we did bring this to the planning and development committee in March and have a conversation there. Uh, and we put together a consultation plan that's for this summer. And, and we're ready to put that out. I just want to make sure we check in with uh, the community first. So the background as far as what current address looks like. Uh, so, there's an old town area, which is pink. 
those numbers for address and local booking to and then it restarts again right where the break is from out to Old Town Road West to Old Town Road. So this is the difference between the city development and the uh, road network. So from there, it goes from 1 to 86, then 100 to 300, then 600 to 700. And then it jumps where it's between the train tracks and the Trans Canada to 1400 and 1500. So you kind of see how um, it's like a lack of continuity here between the numbers to help with the pre-finding. We're getting along here. So there is one continuous road you have to drop signs aside from you know where you saw the train is connected. And that piece of road is even a kind of one that holds my day. It has three different names currently, and that's Soul Squad Signals Road, Old Town Road, and Old Town Road. West. If you have something on the Soul Squad Signals Road, they're on the right hand side. It goes into kind of crazy right hand angle. So, what we're proposing to consult with the community with them on is the proposal. We're just proposing to consult with our street uh, in the Civic Avenue. The proposal would be to consider changing the name of this road. The old town road. So that would be from Cannes, Canada, and where it flows all the way out to Town Bay. When it comes to addressing, we wouldn't think about touching the addressing that's existing between the train track and the Trans Canada. We would see with those numbers as they are, and then use that as a starting point for where we would continue our number. So the idea would be to number in blocks. And these are in line with uh, district blocks that are part of our original uh, land survey. So we're going from 1,600 to a 1,600 block, 1,700 block, 1,800 block. And what this does is it allow for that road to grow on the district boundary in the future, either through boundary expansion or subdivision out in the municipal district. So what we're doing is we're doing a consultation starting in June 26 with a letter and a website. It would be a companion to that letter. Uh, it would have to the Trenton House or the property owners along there come um, learn more about this and provide their feedback uh, on this proposal. We would also include a survey to get an idea of where people are at on the two different components. So one component is changing the actual numbers. And the other components is what we need. Uh, so the outcome of that should be brought to council as part of a staff report or a proposed amendment bylaw in the fall. All right. Council, any questions? Mr. Bailey. Yeah, I mean, I think the numbering and, and how you're going to do it is a really good start for the consultation for sure. The one question I would really have is the timing of the consultation and whether doing that in July would elicit the responses that we were would be looking for. And if it would be better to have that consultation in the fall um, versus a July summer, people are on holidays. Um, did you guys look at, at at that as part of the timelines? Through the chair? Yes, we did. Uh, so we do have more of our summer owners here in the summer. Uh, the other parents of the survey is that that can remain open up until like September. So we do have folks that are back and forth. Um, and the idea is to mail these people directly to so the mail. So, okay. so Sarah, I, I am, um, I'm not in favor of this process. I find that we're changing the addresses of so many, so many, to address no one yet. Like there is like several businesses in those areas, several manufacturing, industrial park, storage units. You're asking all of those folks to change their address. And there's no one out past zero zero to change their address. 
So I guess my question is, is there another solution? Can those folks that you're talking about changing their address, keep their address, and can you go Old Town Road North? Like, is it necessary for us to gut Old Town Road to add some addresses? Like, could it not be Old Town Road North or Northwest? Or can you not add a, a locator on it as opposed to changing, having businesses and all of those people change their addresses. Like what has the post office come back? Can, are they, would they be happy with the Northwest? Old Town Road Northwest? So I think like that's what this consultation process is intended to So go ahead, Councillor Rich. Through the chair. Are we going to offer people some kind of compensation? So, because it's going to cost to change your mailing address and your numbers, and you know, it's a cost to change your address. So, would we then be reaching out and saying it's going to cost you three hundred bucks to do that? So, that's something we're taking off your taxes, or because that will, you know, that will affect people too in the way they vote. Through the chair, so there, there is a small uh, fund that was set aside as part of the budget. Um, so we could do something kind of like a toilet like baby program, but we're all familiar with a program like that that would help people with changing their house numbers at the, the street. Um, for the website and the letter going out, we include the details so that people can find out what exactly this means to them, and then they can respond back to like, you know what, I'm not really going to go through all these required steps to update my address. Um, and that's what we're trying to find out. Um, the other ones that are trying to support. Um, before, Councillor Bailey, right before you, Sarah, have we looked at other options? Like, is there an option of making that road a northwest road or? Have you looked, have, have we looked, have we exhausted every other option other than having all these people change their addresses? Yes, yeah, so I did map out several different options. Um, this that you see here was a result of some past work. Uh, and this is how we have Old Town Road West and Old Town Road. And I think the issue here is like, as the town develops, where Old Town Road West and Old Town Road where that change is, is not going to be obvious to, to everyone. Like right now, it's fairly obvious that that's a new subdivision, that's new development, and that makes sense. Uh, in future, it won't. Um, and so, you know, part of the best practices when you're doing these rulings kind of really obvious features where that would change. So, so places we would, we would want to see something like that would be at the rail line, the river, uh, the Trans Canada. Um, and at this really like this major intersection with Soul Plus Cruise Road and Old Town Road. So, you know, there are other options. Like, for example, previous applications that the development community has brought with them to change this road. I think this has happened in the past. Um, the feedback that came back was at that time was that the name of Soul Plus Cruise Road is historic and at that point was considered to be very valuable. Um, so, and that may come back again, right? And so you wouldn't necessarily need to change that name. It's just awkward because it's not where you would usually see the name change or the opposite, right? But yeah, I think that's the idea behind doing the consultation is to find out <laughs> from folks what, what their thoughts are. And you want to make sure that you're aware that this wouldn't affect uh, Thompson Place or Thompson Board, but it would affect the manufacturer that is an address directly on both. And consulted on this as well. Yeah. Councillor Bailey. Yeah, thank you for bringing up that point, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, I am sensitive to that. And I haven't, I, I guess I didn't. Hmm, that's a very good point. I think that's why the consultation is going to have to be really important that everybody around there has a has a really good, thorough chance to take a look at this proposal and to comment back on it. And I'm, I'm wondering if this should be wrapped, like it, instead of just doing it in July, we wrap up, like we, we do a couple of consultations in September as well, because people are busy and even the businesses around there, yeah, are, they're, busy. See, they're, they're all busy, right? Yeah. Um, and 
And this just might get lost in the mix. And I think it's really important that it does not get lost in the mix. Um, and, you know, if it takes a little bit longer, I would be totally fine with that because you're right. Uh, this is going to be a pretty big change and it's going to have financial impacts on people as well. Um, so I, I think we're going to go forward with the consultation. We'll have to figure out a way to maybe make it longer, make it make it a, a chance where people can have a little bit of conversation about this in September in a slower period of time. Um, there's no, I don't find any problem with starting it off in July, but just to make sure that everyone is getting a good look at this. Um, and and we, we just have to be prepared that maybe it comes back from the consultation and we hear all these different issues and we have that information and then we really talk about whether this is something that we want to go down that road with uh, for no pun intended. <laughs> I'll serve Bush, so. Through the chair. Um, yes, sir, great, uh, great uh, presentation. It uh, really makes your eyes open uh, to see, you know, how complicated it can be. But it sometimes, like Colleen says, it doesn't have to be complicated or the mayor. Um, you know, Old Town Bay has been, you know, Old Town Bay for, you know, if you've lived here, been, been that forever. And maybe it maybe it's its own, you know, like a, when you go to Boulder in, in Nevada, it, you're on, the, on a, basically a, a freeway and you come into Boulder and they have a little, uh, you know, uh, arc over the over the main street as you come into that Boulder area and it, and it turns into Boulder. And it, uh, it's, it's, you know, maybe that, maybe the developers, you know, might want to maybe put up an entrance sign and it could be called Old Town Bay Road instead of Old Town Road West or whatever. But it's just, you know, I, I understand where, where you're, you know, how, how complicated this is. And if we don't have to spend a whole bunch of, to change, you know, change a whole bunch of people's addresses and everything, maybe this is the right way to do it is maybe it becomes Old Town Bay in, in, on its own and that any, anything past the entrance is now Old Town Bay and it's, there's a designation of a new area. You know, just something to think about. That's a good idea. It's a really good idea. So, Anyone else wanna jump in on this? Councillor Evans. Thank you, through the Chair. I'm all for uncomplicating it. Um, I totally see how it goes from Old Town um, Road to Old Town West. And I think we should get rid of that somehow. Make a little more consistent that way. Um, so a question then, Sarah, is the um, part of the problem is that we're out of numbers. So that's part of the issue. Through the chair, that is correct. Yeah, so we've been an issue with the options where it continues to the numbering and the issues that are discussed. One, a document, and those numbers in the are just so close together that there isn't room for the assignment to your numbers. So that's kind of where the issue is. These are the portions that are not in the AOR on the north side, and we are seeing a lot of pressure there. So the area that would be yellow above the road, for example, there's some interesting terms and subdivision up there. So again, like when you do number one, it's the best to go the system regardless of the road, just to make it easier for people to find where they're going. It's most important to the numbers services. And we all know we like getting our hands on our time. And so that's where most of our complaints around that doesn't come from, or we like with the party that's on the one. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I think I, I think that we should um, just sort of review other options, though, as well. You know, in a city, you've got um, it's usually divided into four as well. So you've got northwest, northeast. But, but if that's not, you know, um, a, a, an appetite for the council, then I, I really like Councillor Bushel's idea of turning Old Town Bay into Old Town Bay and saving a lot saving a lot of work and a lot of frustration for people because it's just yeah changing your address is complicated i changed mine two years ago and still missing stuff so it's complicated pam thank you through the chair is it just really the the one blue section in the middle that stops at one that we're that we're most worried about like where do we go in terms of numbers through the chair 
Yes, that is part of the issue. And certainly in looking at some of the other ones where it could be said that we have a point. Excuse me, Carol. In this area kind of here, yeah. the, this is where there was a real issue in trying to get enough numbers to support uh, additional parcels being created along that road frontage. I know it's steep there, um, but there is some potential there for additional parcels. So the numbering just wasn't working out. I do have other maps that I, of course, am more than willing to share with council. We did work through a number of scenarios. And when I say we, I made them and ran them by Scott. <laughs> I wasn't missing anything. Um, because yeah, we, we did try to come up with something that would be as, as least disturbing as possible for people. And it just made the most sense to find out how much support there is to just clean this right up and put it in bit, basically. Uh, Pam, could I get you to turn your mic off? Because Sarah's kind of go ahead, Councillor Bailey. So just there's a lot of obviously, you know, discussion around that. I think it's really good discussion. Um, are we Maybe going in the direction, if I could suggest something, is that we we get a couple more options brought back to us that do not require the consultation and, and just a one uh, name road. I, I'm just trying to see where we kind of go from here and really simplify it. I mean, I'd be in favor of that if there is a, a process for that. I, I Councillor Bushel's suggestion yeah, oh, might might actually really really work, and it requires some signage or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it could save people all that awesome. hassle, then it's definitely worth a look at. Yeah, our job is to simplify, not complicate. So I guess um, is it council's wish to get a few more, a couple more options to to this, Ian? Yeah, I I, I think so. Council Beach. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think you need to think about it. Well, I, I think the options could be generated from the residents, and the first step would be consultation. Without an option? I see what you're saying. Is to no, I think we go ahead, Councilman. You're, you're suggesting as part of, of any future consultation, we give you know kind of a suite of options, like here's what we're thinking, and what do you think of these? Yeah. That, that could, I would say, work on a concept. But here's this, this yeah. your option. What do you guys think of it? Okay. Councillor Bushel, do you want, to, what do you, how do you think? No, I, I agree. If, uh, you know, I think it would be, have, it'd be nice to have two or three options before we go to the public, but still go to the public. Yeah. Councillor Rich? Yeah, I think we need to. I think it's a big change for people. Councillor Evans? Yeah, I just want to see best practices for a good consultation. Mm -hmm. So we can have some parameters for the, people to respond to. Perfect. Sarah, can we get a couple more options? Thank you so much. Any other comments? Sorry, Sarah. Sorry, so I just want to clarify is, um, are you making a motion sure. for Bailey? Yes. For staff to investigate options and report back to council prior to proceeding within the- With the consultation. Patient. Sure. Okay, and is there a seconder? I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, moving along. Expression of interest, 1220-148 housing commercial development. Kelly, are you taking them? Um, yeah, I am, but I have um you've got a list. And uh, so just give me a second on the screen. Um, I'm still sharing that in our time. Right. Um, so for starters, I'm assuming you guys have all read through the gist of that expression of interest or at least um, some chunks of it. Um, I will give, hold on, I got to fix this because I'm sharing the wrong screen. Sharing. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. I'm just going to bring it up here. Okay. So we've got a draft expression of interest. Uh, it's completely draft right now. Um, so it's here for any review, comments, feedback, anything that you want to see in here. Um, high level, uh, what we want to do is of, of, of this EOI is we want to get a developer for the construction of a mixed use building with commercial on the bottom floor and residential above, as well as some family townhomes. 
Uh, it's to solicit proposals from qualified housing developers and builders interested in leveraging the district owned properties, which is in an attachment. It's you guys know which one it is. Um, and really, we want to provide a mix of attainable commercial and residential rental units, as well as attainable and or affordable family townhomes. Um, it needs to be compatible with the surrounding neighborhood um, and incorporate. we want uh, community input. The eligible respondents can be for-profit or not-for-profit, <laughs> so it doesn't really matter uh, that piece, but we want uh, information on their experience. That's going to be very important uh, in terms of doing similar types of housing developments. Uh, with a similar complexity. Uh, if they've partnered with municipalities before, that's also important. If they've if they've got a track record using funds and that they have the finances avail available to do it. Um, and if they've worked with communities before to, to, garner to garner support and their ability to work with municipal uh, representatives. Um, so those are some of the some of the things that we're looking for with our eligible respondents. Uh, the scope is we want to receive a site plan, uh, maximizing the density of the site with the mixed use building, um, as well as um, fronting Main Street, as well as attainable and or affordable family townhomes. We want to see what the um, operational interior design would be. So basically outlining the mix of housing options, which should be addressing our housing needs assessment, which is attached, which, which outlines really what our needs are. So I want the proponent to let us know what is needed there, whether it's studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, uh, and then a, a plan, a timetable, and a property management plan. Because not only do we want these people to build it, but we want them to manage it. But, um, and in that, I've just got a few other little things in here. Um, I just wanted to point out, I've got this uh, thing, uh, the land valuation that's subject to, you know, what the proposal is that the district is willing to contribute the lands for the project. So we'd have to do a partnering agreement. So we'll work out those details. That's phase two, maybe phase three, but we're willing to give the land up, transfer the title if we get what we want out of, out of this project for our community. Uh, and as well as we want an idea of what their proposed rate rental rates are going to be in, in their uh, proposal. And then we talk about the Eagle Valley Affordable Housing Project briefly as it's adjacent to the property and that these two developments need to speak to each other. So there's a, a schedule within here that shows the proximity of it um, to there and that they need to speak, uh, that, that we'll do a site visit um, at some point in July, uh, who they need, to, what we want in their submittals, which is very clear on here. The timeline is hopefully if everybody's good, the next week I can put out the COI. We'll have some kind of meeting in July, deadline in August. Um, and then we can have a few. Um, I'm, I'm proposing that we have an evaluation committee, a uh, couple counselors, couple staff uh, to go through these proposals. This is a really important project for the District of Sycamus. And I think this is a team effort to make sure we're getting the right partner uh, to do this job. So I want some input from people and we can determine who's on that committee uh, later on in July. That's not, it's not till it closes, then we'll all get together and, and kind of uh, and, um, review our submissions as well as have some interviews with these people, with, with whomever we choose. And maybe we choose a couple and then they come in front of council. So we'll work out that and then hopefully we can award it at, uh, in September. So that is the high level gist of it. And then I've, I've got the site as appendixes, the site map, uh, the location in regards to the Eagle Valley Senior Citizens Housing Society. I've got our housing needs assessment and our, the housing strategy. So it, I tried not to make it too wordy because sometimes then you're, you lose the purpose, but I did need to try to encompass some important things in here. I'll just click on an attachment. So this is one uh, attachment which shows, you know, so mm -hmm. the Eagle Valley project and uh, how it may speak to this project here. And then just information about the site here, what the zoning is, that it's one and a half, approximately one and a half acres and some preliminary information. And then anybody who knows anything about doing this knows what questions to ask as well. So, and with that, I'm open to feedback, comments, questions, anything that you have on here. Thank you so much, Kelly. That's a great job. And it's it's such an exciting project. So um, yeah, so Councillor Bailey. Yeah, I mean, 
I think it's a really, it, it's good. It's not too wordy. It's not too, um, you know, it, it, but it gives you a significant amount of details or, or like enough of details. The one thing I, I did read through it pretty carefully, and I would change from my opinion, um, we don't need attainable commercial. I would like to see the commercial be a component where you could actually get more attainable housing from the commercial side of it. And a lot of the projects in, um, you know, it's, it's a commercial enterprise. You're supposed to be there to make money. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a, 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 um, a rate for commercial properties that are, you know, in line with what prevailing rates are. So, you know, if, whatever we can do to maximize the attainable housing in the EOI is really what I would go for. The commercial on the bottom, no, no problem with that, but that should be at market uh, rates really. And, and then whatever we get on that market rates, if that amplifies what we can do on attainable housing, perfect. That's kind of my feedback on it. Yeah. Councilor McCabe. Thank you. Yeah, this is super exciting. It's uh, one of the, most interesting things I've been involved with in council in the last three terms. Um, really looking forward to this. And thank you, staff, for um, as soon as you've seen the concept from Eagle Valley Senior Citizens Housing, um, bang, you put this out. So uh, no moss under staff's feet on this one. That's uh, very impressed in the timing. I've got three comments on the EOI. If I could just go uh, on page four with the bullets there. Uh, under development plan timetable. Maybe one bullet should be substantial completion. Maybe another bullet maybe should be a, an actual move-in date. Just just suggestions, I'm not saying it has to happen. Uh, and then on the next page, a land valuation. Um, typically, if you have a housing project, affordable housing, we, we waive uh, property taxes too. So maybe in there to tweak um, parent as a parent to uh, anybody who might respond to this, suggest that uh, we would have, we would consider uh, transferring the property, but also as new owners that they would also consider waiving property taxes if if there's if there's a if there's a housing agreement in place that proves that that is going to be attainable housing and stay attainable housing per a certain period of time, 10 years or whatever it might be. So just maybe add that in there. Right. Um, can I comment on that? Huh. Um, just because we have a proper tax exemption in place in order to waive taxes. Uh, and I know that we're working on that from our housing strategy in terms of purpose-built rentals. And, um, and then there's also a permissive tax exemption if they're a not-for-profit society. So it's, there's, it depends on the scenario. So maybe we put um, something about other incentives in terms of um, potential um, tax tax or development cost charges, depending of, on the mix and affordability of it. Yeah. Right. We'll just put something a little high level. Yeah, higher level. You didn't have, to, I wasn't suggesting if I'm, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just had one other point. Yeah. Um, yeah, just high level stuff like, um, the potential for, or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then on page seven under valuation criteria, it would be easier for the evaluation team to put a benchmark in there, what the minimum criteria is. You've identified them in, in, in this expression of interest, but if you bring them back down there in, in bullet form to say, um, the successful proponent has to meet these minimum criteria of a, of a housing management plan, of, uh, of, of, the criteria that you've already mentioned throughout the document, just bring the key elements back into that way. You, if you get six, six proposals, you can whip through them easily and say, okay, well, these didn't meet the minimum criteria. And they're out. Huh? It, and, and it'll help organize the proponent in, in laying it out too, I think, and how it's weighted. That's all I had for, uh, and that's all I have for suggestions. And, um, Thank you again for put, putting this out so quick. And this is super exciting stuff. It is exciting. I agree. It is super exciting uh, stuff. I, um, I personally don't think it needs a tax exemption. I think that it's adding, we have infrastructure that we have to connect to this. So I 
would rather not see an incentive if it gets into the nitty gritty down into the weeds and we have to negotiate something, then I prefer not to put that on the table right now. I prefer to have that in my back pocket and and get the benefit to the community as in taxes as, as high as we can. That's my thought. Anyone else have any comments? I'm sorry, just one other point. I was gonna, in terms of the ownership of the land going forward, I, I think we should never transfer that land. It should be something on a lease. Uh, other towns have, have done that. If you take a look at around Vancouver, around Falls Creek, it's all leased lands. That's how, that's how they built the co-ops. Um, those leases come up. I think they just recently came up for, you know, renewal. And then the, the you know, the city just renews it. It could be a very long-term lease, like 50 years or whatever, whatever kind of makes sense. But if we ever gave away that land, we're never going to get it back. So when you lease it, there's options for future second moose to go, hey, we got an acre and a half of land coming up. Uh, maybe we can reimagine this. Or maybe the building needs to be redone. But it stays something that you know the town could use for, you know, affordable housing or or whatever going forward. So that'd just be my only kind of point on that. Kelly, how complicated is that? Yeah. Well, totally an option. So we can we can put in here that transfer of the title or enter into a long term lease. We'll keep it flexible. Something like that. At this yes. point, because um, from a developer perspective, it's more attractive for them. Yeah if they have the land and then it's theirs, right? And so this is where we don't want to scare anybody away, but I think having the flexibility of putting both in there for now and seeing what we get and where they're at and what they like, and maybe it is a not-for-profit group that's good with that, or maybe it's a private developer who, who doesn't want to do, right? So this is where let's keep our options open. Yeah, just to follow up on that. I just would like to see that the model that we're going with ultimately, I mean, and this will be part of the process, is something where we're not turning this piece of property into something to make money out of, right? On a real estate basis, um, you know, that that we have the ability to provide ongoing uh, affordable homes or attainable homes and whatever we can do to, to do that. I mean, there's several models where, you know, and I think we've discussed it around here in terms of whether it's a co-op or whether you're buying into it and then it gets sold back to the, the co-op, but there's not that real estate pop that people are looking for. That's, I think we're, we're trying to get homes here, attainable homes. And, and I think that's why I mentioned about the lease is that we just have that ability to make sure that this is an ongoing legacy and, and positive legacy for us on the attainable housing side. So, yeah. Perfect. Anyone else? Okay, um, Blake, I, go ahead. I just want to summarize so we're all on the same page. Um, so um, updating to market commercial, but attainable residential rental units. Yeah. Everybody's on side with that, right? Um, development plan, potentially change it to substantial completion, move-in date. Um, um, maybe add a general con um, comment about uh, other uh, incentives that may be negotiated keep it loose because uh, there is like permit fees and stuff like that that we can play with that we do have that flexibility with but we won't necessarily specifically get into the weeds on it um provide uh some more clarity on uh, in the evaluation criteria section um and then adding a little line in there about or a long-term lease that seem okay and everybody's good with the timeline and good for me to issue it next week sounds good Councillor Bushel you know, through the chair, they're really all good points. Uh, just the one um, on the on the on the um, covering letter. Is there any way we could? Because uh, sometimes you, you have to read. We could maybe put in uh, uh, our vacancy rate, or you know, you know, I, without dabbling into the housing strategy and strategy and all that. Anywhere, just like an incentive to make them make it pop out at them. Yeah. Like in the executive summary. Yeah. Throw in, and I don't know. I could throw in some. High level stats like there's a yeah. from the housing needs assessment a need of 260 units within Sycamus mm. and our vac like I'll, I can throw out some key stats in the executive summary. That's a good idea. Something to just kind of hook them a little bit. You're on fire today, Councillor Bushel. <laughs> <laughs> idea machine going. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Hey, 
Um, okay, Kelly. And and further to Ian's comments about what this is going to look like and us wanting control, most definitely we wouldn't even consider giving up our land or anything unless we 100% have housing agreements, covenants on title. Like it, it will be locked and loaded. And and the whole reason we're giving up the land, whether it's via a no payment lease or a transferring title, is because our community needs rental housing and townhomes and and affordable housing and so um that's why we're doing it so there definitely will be lots of uh covenants and and agreements in place uh to make sure that that will stay like that for a long time yeah perfect thank you all right moving along nicole whistle cessation yeah, that's it. What's up, blowing? <laughs> Go ahead, Nicole. From a resident from Silver Sands Resort. Uh, in addition to the request, council or we requested that we also look into Salt Lake Room Railway crossings. Sorry, Nicole, can I get you to speak up or yeah. is that mic on? Yeah, because I don't think anyone. <laughs> right into the mic. Uh, better now. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> so we're reviewing uh, Silver Sand Road Railway Crossing and then all the of use. Uh, I have been on site with uh, Canadian Pacific Kansas City and Daryl to, to discuss uh, what would be required to be able to stop whistling um, as set out by Transport Canada. Um, so what needs to happen is we need to have a professional computer assessment of both railway crossings uh, to determine what, if anything, has to be completed at the crossings for, in terms of improvements. So things like uh, new signage, traveling for pedestrians to and from the crossing, uh, cross bar, things like that. Uh, the, if the improvements are completed, then CP is willing to transfer the liability to the district, and that comes as uh, insurance, and they will be additional insured, and that's about five hundred dollars per crossing per year. We have a few options in terms of how to cover the cost of the request. We can include it in uh, the 2024 deliberation of the budget. And that discussion could include having interested area residents pay a parking tax through a local service area or have all residents pay through general taxation. And then if there's a desire to complete the assessment sooner than that, uh, we can amend the 2023 financial bylaw and include a budget for the assessment now. I forgot to mention the assessment is estimated at around 17000 for both. Okay, Council, Councilor Rich, the chair. I just have a comment. Um, I think the whistle's there for a reason, and it's there to save lives. And I think that side of the tracks is a resort. Um, RVs do come and go. Our beach park is there, so we have a lot of tourists coming in. So we all know how the tracks work and all that good stuff. But that doesn't mean everyone does. And the whistle serves a purpose, and the tracks have been there for a really long time. Thank you, Councillor Rich. Councillor Evans. Yeah, I've, I've put a lot of thought into this, and I read this in detail, and I appreciate your work. Um, I personally am not in favor of spending $17,000 on an engineer's report that might tell us that we're not going to be able to close, um, I mean, shut down the whistles. I, I too, agree that there's a purpose and a life-saving purpose to it. So I, I, I know they're annoying, but I, we're a town with the railway in it, and I think it's part of uh, part of life. So I, I personally don't want to pursue this. Thank you. I am, um, right before you get there, Ian, I will, I, I agree with Councillor Rich and Councillor Evans. I think the whistle's there for a reason. Um, I also think that if, if it were to be mandated, those that don't really care that the whistle blows and this being put into a parcel tax, I think that's an unfair solution 
for, you know, I guess, I don't know how that would roll out at the end of the day. But um, yeah, I think there are whistles there for a reason. I and mean, we live where we live because we loved it and loved it when we moved here. So, Councillor Bailey. Um, thanks, Nicole. This is a great report. It gives us uh, options. It gives us like food for thought. And I, I, I read through it and um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I agree with Councillor Evans. Like I, I can't get to a point where I want to spend $17,000 on an engineer report that might come back and say, hey, too bad. Uh, or we have to put arms on these things that you, you're going to pay. We had a discussion earlier about some uh, a previous council about some uh, works that we have to do in conjunction with CP in this next upcoming year. It will have some budget considerations. Um, but it, yeah, it's I, I I think it's just something that's not going to be a core priority for me. And we're just going to, I, I I agree with the comments, just put it off. Yeah, but thanks for the report. It's really, really <laughs> well written, a lot of detail and I learned something through this report. I didn't realize that, to tell you the truth, that you could even really do this with CP. But um, yeah, thanks again. <laughs> Councilor Beach. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think this feels like a priority for that, for that amount of money and for the change. And I do believe that whistles serve a purpose and that we get used to them. <laughs> Most people do. Thanks, Councillor Beach. Councillor McCabe, did you want to comment on this? No. Councillor Bushell. To the chair, a great report, Nicole. Um, very informative. Uh, I agree with Siobhan. It's, uh, you know, the whistle the whistle's been there forever and it's it's there for a reason. Um, and, and you have to look at, I mean, I appreciate uh, Mr. Moon lives on in that area and he, the train blew the whistle before he purchased. <laughs> And uh, and that's just one resort. There's a whole bunch of people over there, and maybe maybe some of them don't mind it, but it's just one resort. So I I, I tend to stick, to stick to more of a safety cop. You know, we look after this, you know, the residents and the and uh, and the tourists and all the people that you know that are crossing there and are playing over there. So I, I tend to agree with Siobhan. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you for the report. Where do we go from here? Because this was brought up by residents so and now we're having this conversation is there more to be shared with them like where do we go from here i would expect a response is required back to the applicant on behalf of silver sense resort hey so staff can draft a letter do i need do we need to make a resolution or you know that the the committee uh, received this report for information with no further action perfect okay thanks nicole good job Oh, sorry. No, and just related to this. Um, so at the Salsqua, no, the Silver Sands Crossing, we had brought up previously about some work that needed to occur, and we did get a detailed invoice from them. They, I guess, they lifted up some of the stuff, and they realized, oh, it's not as bad as originally what they thought. So they can defer the repairs for about three years. So which means we don't have to put anything in our budget next year. Maybe in three years, we put a placeholder there. I'm assuming everybody's fine with that. Yeah, no, that's yeah. awesome. Councilor McKay. Are they changing what currently exists there? Because I see some stuff sitting beside there, those concrete pads. Are they, because the crossing right now is horrible. Yeah. Absolutely horrible. Nicole, do you know? that they are doing that there, what they don't have to make for that, and they need Okay, so that's not the end product there. That's not the end product right now. Okay, but that will be deferred next year. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, okay, 2023 Union of BC Municipalities Convention meeting requests. Carlo, take it away. Uh, thank you, Chair the Chair. So this is a fun topic, I think. <laughs> uh, I love convention. Uh, Union of BC <laughs> Municipality Convention happens every year. This year, it is September 18th to 22nd in Vancouver. It's an opportunity for local governments to lobby the province about issues that matter to them. 
So you have three successful resolutions that were endorsed by SILGA that will be presented there. You also have the opportunity to meet with uh, cabinet ministers of the different ministries, as well as staff from ministries, agencies, um, commissions and corporations of the province. So today we're basically, staff is asking for direction from council as to what meeting requests you would like us to submit. Uh, so there is a timeline. The, the requests for meetings with uh, cabinet ministers, they must be submitted by June 30th. And then we have a little bit more time for meetings with staff, which is August 30th. So if we could talk about the ministry meetings that you would like to pursue, that would be wonderful. Okay, well, I think that we should start with all the resolutions that we have on the table that are going to um, UBCM. So I guess environment. Oh, sorry, and I'll just add that through the chair that um, we do have a document up here with some proposed meetings and maybe Kelly, if you wanna add to yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, so we yes. do have some proposed ones and then change anything, add anything. And we can also talk about this at the next council meeting because we still have some time. We just thought we'd start to get the juices flowing. Uh, so we've got Ministry of Health with the Shushwap Healing Center just to talk to them about operational funding, anything just exactly. Yeah. Uh, Ministry of Forest, uh, just regroup on the regional community forest. We had a great meeting last time and I think we need to carry continue on. Uh, I'll head Mountain Bike Park. Let's if we haven't got the Section 57 approved by September, then they're going to hear from us again. Uh, uh, one about the aquatic, the invasive species with the Ministry of Environment. Also, uh, repairing areas regulation. Let's talk to the Ministry of Environment about that as well. We add to that one. Yeah. Um, should we be chatting with them about our sewage treatment plant? Yeah, actually, that is a great point. So I was talking to Daryl. And we want to talk with actually some of the staff from Ministry of Environment. So then we have we can connect with people that we can phone. But it doesn't hurt to also meet with the ministry on that as well, right? We can do a ministry meeting and then a staff meeting as well. So let's throw that on there because these are what we are asking for. Sometimes we don't get all of the meetings. It just depends. So I think it's good to throw that throw that on there. That you're on it because we were already talking about meeting with staff for that. Whoops. Okay. I'll throw that on there. And then we've got MOTI for the highway corridor plan, which we've been talking about for a long time, as well as a, a, a community transportation plan, which they've verbally told us they're going to give some funding for, um, but we haven't. So we can just try to knock on that door again. How about uh, tourism, Minister of? Um, who is it? Minister. We can find the right minister. If we're... Find the right minister. <laughs> find a minister uh, because there are some grants and uh, we're looking at the pedestrian bridge, which could be pretty iconic and special for the area to tie those that rail trail together. So I think that there maybe there's some funding there. That would, yeah, probably. Encouragement of some sort. Yeah, probably Ministry of Municipal Affairs. We'll, we'll see, pedestrian bridge funding, but that's a good one. Councillor Bushville. Yeah, and to add to that, there was a hint that they might uh, expand their municipal or the resort municipal uh, initiative. So those, mm -hmm. those are the special communities that are resort towns that get extra funding. There was talk about that. And I don't, so maybe we could hit them up for that. That'd be good. That's a good one. Um, Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> Councillor Bailey. Just to uh, follow up on what we're talking about today about uh, forest fires and how maybe it would be useful to have a, a, a meeting. I don't know what ministry that falls under, but to talk to them about small town mitigation in terms of protecting us from future forest fires. It's an emerging issue. It's something I think we're going to be dealing with for a long time. So, absolutely. Idea. Councillor Butchell. Yeah, I had that one down as well with the emergency management BC. Yeah. And uh and also flood mitigation, you know, just before Great. this they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, I agree. Anyone else right now have anything to add to that? Councillor Evans? I'd I'd like to uh give this some more thought. At the next meeting, can we bring up absolutely who we think of? Do we have time for this one? Uh, 
through the chair. Yes. Yeah. We have some time. We can, you know, it's the 28th, I believe is the next meeting. And so we would have a couple of days to prepare. So if we have a good idea of what we can start preparing now, and then there's a few extras that's manageable. Yes. Councilor McCabe. Thanks. A uh, couple points for the pedestrian bridge. Great idea. Uh, we have a $50,000 grant right now for the concept that that may be a class D estimate or a couple of concepts and maybe some costs. When, when will that be complete? Will that be complete before these meetings? Uh, take it away. Uh, to do what? <laughs> so Daryl and I are meeting with them probably the first week of July to go over some of the concepts, but yeah, probably be, I'd say before these meetings that should be complete. Hey. Okay, so to carry on my point there, or not my point, just discussion, whatever, is uh, we should take the output of that report and ask for some uh, design money for de construction design, not not for construction, but the next step would be uh, funding for a detailed design ready for construction, which would probably be half a million dollars or something. So if the timing's right, we could take the output of that report ask for an audience and our ask there would be for the next phase for funding for um, a detailed design. And then and then we can, then we'll be sitting on a design ready for construction one step forward. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the comment on a designated resort, I, I don't know, I think that needs to be a discussion on council if, if that's the direction we wanna take our community before we ask for an audience with the minister and that discussion hasn't happened. Okay, fair enough. Pastor <laughs> um, Bailey. Yeah, just sorry. Before, uh, since we were literally just talking about it, and I don't see it on the list, but uh, a meeting with the minister of housing about proposals we have in terms of attainable housing. And I don't know, maybe there's a potential there to start a conversation around more. I don't know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> just throwing it out there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Councillor Bushel. Uh, yeah, I had that one down, and the last one was MOTI. Can we learn anything more? <laughs> Who knows if the bridge is going to go ahead? If the bridge, if the bridge <laughs> hasn't started yet, I think that should be part of this conversation, but, as well as our access, um, uh, our corridor plan, our access corridor plan. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Counselor be <laughs> Well, oh man. I think you have a big list there. Well, I've been writing everything down. I don't disagree with any of it, but I'm I'm trying to think. Um Ministry of I guess we've got Ministry of Health down, but we need to focus on mental health and addiction somehow. So um yeah, I think we need to talk to them about how they're managing their <laughs> the government's managing it. Well, no, but I think we need to share some discussion with them. I don't know. It's okay. Yeah, that would be my one. They'll put some thought into how to address that. Staff can put some thought into how to maybe address to address some issues around that. Councillor McCabe. Yeah, um, Councillor Ian, uh, quick my memory on the housing. So Kelly's done a great job, staff has done a great job in expression of interest. And uh, in, in that expression of interest, it said that, that they encouraged the, the proponents to, to uh, look for funding sources. So maybe we could take our expression of, in, expression of interest and try to get a with the housing minister or high level staff and say, um, this is going out in, in June or July, whenever the dates are. And would we be able to tell uh, any proponents submitting that uh, you're receptive to providing us for funding through BC Housing on this project? Maybe we can line up the grant for a successful proponent. Mm -hmm. We can have that conversation. For uh, have that conversation. Sure. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. In our housing needs assessment, we need 260 units, and, and we got 36 on the go, and this might provide maybe 50 more, and that only takes us halfway there. And 
combined with the expression of interest and we're shovel ready and we have the land. They love, we tick all the boxes. They, they, they might jump on it and say, yeah. Good point, good point. Okay, are we good? Is that a wrap? Yep, this okay. is a lot. I mean, last year, I think we did 11 and I, I think the one day it was like the amazing race of meetings. Yeah, you know, things are, it's, you know, they're important, but they're a lot of work. If we go there, we want to be prepared. Absolutely. Most of us have been running from meeting to meeting for eight years. So we get wear sneakers and stay low. Wear flat shoes. Flat shoes and stay low. Yeah. So okay, perfect. Be quick. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are going to go to um, council reports. And Ellie, if you want to bring up the strategic plan, Councillor Evans get you to start sure Thanks. thank you through the chair um he's always dead it matches me okay um <laughs> yeah um, I, I had a good meeting yesterday with the early years um with the different agencies that work with kids um and uh i'm excited to uh, talk about um our end of things what's going on we're expanding services under um Amara Kieran uh leading the daycare um and just to correct the disinformation that's out in the community right now um it's not causing anybody's taxes to go up um this is an expansion of services so that we have we'll have building that can um have infant toddler services to uh for parents that need to go back to work their, their little little kids can get mm -hmm. care there and also um we will be moving um, to after school program over there, and um, that will be licensed so that parents can apply for the ten dollar um, care there as well. Um, so nobody's taxes are going up. The um, the leaders of our new our new leaders of the daycare have got grants and they're taking care of it all. Um, we probably spent a little money when Daryl and the boys um, removed playground equipment, which will probably go to Parkview School, which will bless that school, and we'll get new stuff. And none of it is coming out of our pocket. It's all gravy, and it's all excellent work. So um, people that are spreading this disinformation, if you're listening, please stop. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Evans. Can we also do a post or something to, or have we been doing? Mm -hmm. uh, through the chair. Uh, so... Amar and Kieran and the um, Kids Kingdom Child Care Society, they have a plan in place and we will be soon releasing some information. Um, we just need to do that in conjunction, in, in conjunction with okay. them. So we will Okay, be good idea, thank you. But I mean, people that don't know can still phone and find out for sure. They can talk to you, Councillor Evans or- And nobody has. And no one has. Yeah, and further to, um, um, Councillor Evans' comments, it actually will cost the taxpayer less because now we are not running the Kids Club program, which costs us, you know, I don't know, I'd say 60 to 100,000 a year to, to run the Kids Club program because, yeah, it, it costs us, it's a lot of our recreational programming is Kids Club. And now we don't have to do that. We can focus those resources on actual recreation programming. So, so if anything, it'll actually save the taxpayers money. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Rich. The chair, um, housing committee meeting last week, uh, which went really well. And I believe on July 6th, there'll be kind of an open house with the housing committee at the Red Barn. So that's going to be fun. And breakfast with the mayor, which was great. And breakfast was great and lots of neat faces out there. So that was good too. Thanks, Councillor. It's Councillor Bushell. Through the chair. Uh, yeah, we had a great breakfast there. The Colleen did a good job at the mayor's breakfast. And uh, it was well attended, sold out as, as usual. And um, yeah, I, uh, what else did we do? We also, uh, Ian and I had a meeting with the tours, with Ec Economic Development Corporation in regards to tourism and, and recreation. And uh, what else? Oh, planning developments, gotten his team is uh, keeping us busy. There's lots of, lots, lots of things on the go there. And other than that, I just wanted to recognize that the uh, Okanagan mainland Minor Hockey Association recognized Sycamus Minor Hockey Association uh, this year, and uh, they got a trophy and everything. So that was kind of cool. And uh, kudos to the board of directors for running a great, uh, great crew. And that's all I got to report. Perfect. No, any snippets you want to share about the ECDEV and TAC 
Um, I guess, uh, yeah, we just, uh, you know, we, we were just brainstorming. We had, uh, who else was there? There was Colleen Dales was there, Carly, Ian, myself, and Daryl. And Daryl gave us a little bit of an update. Um, yeah, no, it was it was just more brainstorming than anything, really. Thank you. Councilor McKay. Uh, seeing as Councilor Rich, uh, Housing Committee, uh, we did a walkabout and looked at a few examples of some infill. Um, uh, and if I wasn't shown, I wouldn't have known. So uh, form and character matches the neighborhood. And it gives an example of how you can infill without impacting the form and character of the neighborhood. Um, Mayor's breakfast too. Uh, got to sit with uh, Sergeant Murray McNeil. So I think we the second table to be served. He had a gun. <laughs> and, That's why I chose him. <laughs> and developing corp, we did a business walk. I think Councillor Rich did that also. Um, so we knocked on a few businesses and uh, identified some glitches coming up that uh, uh, that the court might want to focus on. So it was quite interesting. So those glitches will be coming to someone. Well, just uh, and and um, I was hooked up with um, Dave Hamilton. Hamilton. Yeah, and. Uh, we went to uh, the machine works shop on on Pinlison there, and uh, and where else? But we we quickly realized that there's not going to be any maintenance for sea dews or ski dews or or boats for repairs if splashes goes down and JB Marine is selling and no one picks up that business and and I forget the name of the machine works like Max Machine Max Machine sorry my apologies um yeah so there's going to be a, a gap there to provide service to tourists that are playing with the toys basically yeah yeah we need to do a, a call out to this for businesses to come to sycamus because we so it, have the biz it's something that the dev corp will grab onto and, and focus on trying to attract don't forget council beach don't forget please <laughs> oh park bikes, bikes. <laughs> can over be run over by bikes absolutely bikers yes yeah. sorry my phone died i had my report on there but anyway they will win just as they work for you technology um, technology go, go health go health network um uh, or not rural health network went to with karen and and uh, janet to whistler to the rural health uh, conference and it was awesome and uh, very proud to receive the award for the District of Sycamus uh, Community Award uh, given in for their collaborative efforts with the community on health and keeping health uh, alive and well in our community. Uh, lots of uh, inspiring uh, accolades that came out of that for District of Sycamus and um, Got some interesting contacts. I think um, Karen has already had some discussions of with uh, with a couple who uh, started a, a run a medical training center, a medical school back east, and are working with SFU uh, to start up. They're interested in a training center, and they like our concept. So just me making some good contacts. Lots of good information that was uh, not only applicable to doctors and nurses, but to all of us talking about mental health, um, care, Indigenous, uh, cultural uh, sensitivity, just lots of good workshops that we we all managed to attend. And it was a great, it was a great weekend. Lots of connections made. Good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for representing. Yeah. And that, well, it was my pleasure. And uh, not only that, I did do a few other things. I had a Shuchaw Watershed Council meeting earlier today, and that had some interesting, interesting things um, that uh, more border cross, more, more checks. Um, well, no, they, no, there are no more checks, but we did talk about they did talk about um bringing bringing that up um at uh, ubcm and um and also we were talking about that 
them putting a letter out as well about the, the invasive species uh, as well. It was a big concern. Um, but yeah, lots of good stuff. I think that the, some of the algal bloom stuff uh, has been, is, is going well. Their program supporting the farming grants uh, for, you know, sort of controlling the runoff into the rivers and stuff. There's a lot of interest and a lot of participation. So those those things are are going going well. Um, it, yeah. So I think yeah, I think the invasive species was was a hot topic for sure. We can expect some support. Thanks, Pam. Councillor Bailey. Yeah. So as Gord mentioned, that uh, we had a really good meeting with ECDEV and the tourism um, folks. And I think where we, it was a lot of brainstorming, but it was also a lot of stuff identifying what we have already available to us and how we could move that forward. And I think based on what we talked about as a council and where they are at, we're really well aligned uh, to continue to. Uh, you know, increase our tourism footprint in this town, but also take a look at other economic development opportunities. Um, you know, the really good news, and I think this is, Carly mentioned this um, at council when she was here last time, was our the growth that we're seeing in the MRDT money is 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 quite impressive, and uh, I think that'll continue. And we talked a lot about strategies around that. So, um, yeah, I think that's on track, and we're probably going to get to a point where we're going to need more resources there, which is also a really good thing. So I think all things positive, but um, so that meeting went well. One thing that I've been talking a little bit about and I sent around an email here earlier was, you know, just the feedback that I've been getting. And it's not really something that I'm involved in as a counselor, but, you know, I've been hearing lots of comments around the high our development out in Malacqua and, you know, the desire for people for housing, housing of all types and housing of all scopes. And I wanted to bring this up kind of in my, um, I guess, counselor report, just to, just to highlight that our community is facing and having a crisis. And I know this is going towards CSRD tomorrow and that's gonna be their decision. Um, but I just wanted to give some feedback that I've heard from my own staff, and so many of them actually live out of Malqua because it is it is considered one of the more affordable areas or where there is private affordable housing stock. And, um, you know, just to put my pitch in for it uh, from a business owner perspective, not so much as a counselor, but I'll, I'll use my counselor um, position to, to do that, is that um, anything that we can do to kind of move the dial in the favor of more housing, I, I think we personally should be doing. I think the business community probably feels that way too. I think a lot of people in town feel that way. And I just hope that the CSRD, when they're considering it, looks at it through those lens and, and gives it a full you know um, consideration. Uh, it's It's done by somebody who lives in our community, has been a part of our community, and that uh, I think fills a need um, that we're all looking forward uh, to having in our community and surrounding areas. So that's it for my report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I will uh, address that a bit because I did put on the CSRD board and um, have expressed interest and it expressed you know, that um, it would be beneficial. However, we also need to be careful. It's not our area. We want heads and beds here because <laughs> that's our bread and butter. That's our MRDT. We have no MRDT from area E. So while I support it, I also want those folks in our restaurants in our beds here. So I'm torn a little bit. And uh, so, but if it is um, residential housing that is year round residential, not short term renters, um, then by all means, I support, you know, definitely support that for sure. But I guess we'll see what the board does tomorrow. Unfortunately, just to clarify, I can't speak to this or vote on it because I'm not an area director. I'm a mayor. So it's a different voting process. So yeah, uh, we don't pay, we don't play. So 
um, and even speaking to it is um, not in our best interest. It is area E, Director Martin's area, so, and um, the other area directors. So that would be their decision. So however it plays out, it plays out. Um, the rural health, I don't know if you guys have seen the video, the BC rural health video that Malcolm and Pam and oh. Siobhan, was Siobhan in there? Yeah. Oh, I was only in there for a second. Kelly, Kelly. and yeah. Karen. If you haven't seen it, it's really good. I think Malcolm was kind of the, the star of the show. It well, seems like he was the I guy was, that was... I wasn't very impressed. <laughs> but you know what? There's some really good information. Oh, God, I'm getting old. We all are. <laughs> Back to life. Oh, it's good. But anyway, so um, I don't know. If you, if you haven't seen it, you should just click on it. It's somewhere in our emails. Um, Kelly and I attended FCM. And um, it was it was um, it was a really good experience. The oh, there I am. The uh, the content was good. I find us uh, very progressive, and I find Sycamus, and we are what people are talking about. We are already doing or involved in. So it was it was kind of uh, for me. It was like, man, we're we're pretty we're keeners. Yeah, we're keeners. Um, I, the contacts that contacts that we made are amazing, and the relationships that we started uh, creating are. Oh, that's a, yeah, you're right. <laughs> we're getting old. <laughs> getting up the pictures. <laughs> anyway, so um, the banquet, that particular banquet, was attended by uh, twenty nine hundred people. It was insane. It's an insanely big conference, 1,600. Imagine four days with 1,600 politicians. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. And no gluten-free beer in the province. Go figure. Really? Um, oh, one. <laughs> Found one. Uh, anyway, so that was good. And uh, we've got some good information, brought back some information on uh, composting and postal service. And so there is... Uh, pump tracks. So there's a lot of good information that we picked up and um, brought back. I attended the uh, grade 12 Eagle Valley High School graduation. Best speech there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, address the grade 12s. They look like they're all, and Councillor Evans is a bit of a rock star at the high school. Just want to point out uh, several of the graduates mentioned um, Bob by name, like, thank you you know, Pastor Evans, like they were the, you've, you've got, had a big impact with those kids. And I think they're going to, they're going to go out and do fine. Like yeah. they all have their stuff together. So no, it was really good. Um, I attended breakfast with the mayor because I was, because <laughs> I was forced to go <laughs> o'clock in the morning. So, um, and I think that those folks just attended because they like eggs Benedict, not because it was breakfast with the mayor. But anyway, that went well, and I'm a CSRD meeting tomorrow, uh, which we've got a couple of hot topics on the um, uh, bylaw for the rail trail, and um, uh, I, I, the property at um, High Resort, which is out of my jurisdiction again, but should be interesting to see. And I think uh, I think that was, there's nothing else blaring on that agenda, so. But anyway, yeah, that's that's kind of been my my wrap. So we are going to go to input from the public. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Anyone online? Anyone in the gallery? Bryant, do you have a question? No <laughs> questions. Deb, you yeah, welcome so. back. Okay, go ahead, Deb. Okay, um, just a quick comment. I'm back in Canada and I'll be back in Sycamus Monday. Um, so I want to thank Council and Daryl for moving forward on the pickleball courts. I think they're going to be a great asset to the community. Uh, Anna Marg is already back and has been going hard and Linda's been going hard. So our, we got those great volunteers helping out and uh, I will make my husband work his butt off starting Monday. So uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks, Deb. Anyone else have any comments online? Nope. Nope. Okay, then that's a wrap. 
Recommendation that the committee in the whole meeting for June 14th, 2023 be adjourned at 412. Could I get a mover? Councilor Rich, Councilor Bailey, all in favor? We're adjourned. Coffee. Back at five.